The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Saturdays or Sundays, SOR Media, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the expressed written consent of SOR Media is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Are you experienced? Then come own the night with us. Brother has taken control, shoveling dirt in every hole. Predators to condemn your soul, watching you and watching me. We're all Station atop the mountains of British Columbia, live from SOR headquarters. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. Like nothing's wrong Soon you will be long You can follow us on our website spacedoutradio.com and on Spaced Out Radio on iTunes You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Dave Scott S-O-R on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. Brother wants to make headlines, be immortalized. Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. I know you're out there. It's Thursday, February 1st, Friday, February 2nd, if you're on the East Coast or across the pond, and this is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you had a great day and night. I am your host, Dave Scott, live from the Great White North in the Caribou region, on top of the mountains of snowy central British Columbia, right here at SOR headquarters. We are 150,000 strong, nightly on WQEE 99 Rock the Key, down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans, and over 160 countries around around the world. We are also live at spacedoutradio.com, Spreaker, The Fringe FM, and if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to revolution.radio and donate today. We're all over social media. We are live on Periscope Television right now. Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow me on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio for our archives. Listen to us on iHeartRadio in the United States. Talk stream live. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download and subscribe to our shows on iTunes. Of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Now, we also have a GoFundMe account going on right now, trying to raise money to improve our broadcast system so we can go to terrestrial radio. GoFundMe.com forward slash we own the night is the website. GoFundMe.com forward slash we own the night. 
We also have a Patreon account up and running. We're just changing it up. Go to patreon.com forward slash spaced out radio to connect with us there as well. Now, if you head to our website, you could shop at our store, read up on the encounter online, dealing with everything paranormal, strange, and odd. We are also with great videos on the site. Tim Doyle's UFO Seekers, Leslie Mitchell Clark's Contact TV, and so much more. We've been hammering the UFO and disclosure subjects pretty hard here on Spaced Out Radio the last few weeks, and tonight is going to be no exception. Now, I realize a few of you are rolling your eyes, but unfortunately, i got to be okay with that. A man who has, for more than 25 years, been a UFO lobbyist in Washington, D.C., joins us to talk about all the happenings surrounding advanced aerial threats. Stephen Bassett has been known, and still is, as one of the premier voices on the subject of UFO disclosure. In fact, he started the popular hashtag di- disclosure on Twitter that even saw John Podesta use it on numerous occasions when trying to get the press to talk to Hillary about UFOs. His Paradigm Research Group has lobbied and held discussions with some of the most powerful people in the United States to teach them about why this advanced subject has to come out. And with all that's gone on in the last six weeks, it's the first time we get to hear Stephen's opinion on whether this is truly disclosure that he has been seeking, or as Grant Cameron just said two nights ago, this is just a confirmation of UFO existence. Stephen Bassett, it's been about eight, nine months since we had you on last on Spaced Out Radio. Always a pleasure to have you right here broadcasting with us. How are you, my friend? pretty good that, that was quite an opening uh, uh dave i uh you, you're really you're really good <laughs> well you know you, really are. you know i i have to tell you and and i'll tell you the same thing that i told grant just two nights ago uh i know you and i don't know each each other well personally we met in 2012 or pardon me 2015 in vancouver when you were there for a discussion with grant with victor vigiani paul hellier and richard mm-hmm. dolan and, you know, I, I've always thought of you and Grant as real mentors of mine in this field, somebody whom I could learn from in my own search for UFOs, because out of all the researchers that I've seen, Steve, I really truly believe the heart that you and Grant have is truly in the right place, which is for the public. And that's the type of people I like to follow and learn from. So anytime I get to speak highly of somebody like yourself or Grant Cameron, I definitely take that chance to do it i appreciate it i'm flattered and uh, i'm flattered for grant as well consider grant flattered on my behalf um yeah look uh, these are interesting times uh and getting more interesting by the day last year was a tough year um you should have done well because last year was about as spaced out a year as i can recall and i go all the way back to uh, the uh, anti-war movement uh vietnam and all that uh, just a crazy year, but oh boy, is 2018 shaping up nice. Um, I guess let me uh, let me start by by using an old aphorism. It's been around a long time. Um, success has many parents, and failure is an orphan. So um, you can be assured that when disclosure does happen. It will have many, many, many parents, and that's okay. No problem with that. And it could happen this year, and we're starting to get the picture. It's starting to come into focus, uh, and that's my job. I, I focus on the bigger picture. I'm not a minutia guy. I'm not trying to find out the name of a particular witness at Roswell 60-some you know, years ago, whatever. I'm, 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 a, I'm trying to get the big picture and trying to connect some dots so that people have some sense Uh, or able to make some sense of what's going on and prepare. Now, disclosure can happen at any time. It always can be the case. All it takes is a head of state, walk out in front of a microphone, and boom. And that could still happen. But not surprisingly, given the tenacity of the truth embargo and how many oxes can be gored by all this and so forth, that it's probably going to sort of unfold. There'll be a process involved a coming together of things, not necessarily a a one-track process. You could have five, six tracks going at the same time. And that's what we're seeing happening here. So 
let's uh, let's go this way. There are some key players to what's unfolding that are emerging without question. There's a lot of interconnection between some of the various groups that are operating and dealing with the soft disclosure process, and I'll talk about that too. But clearly, the most significant thing that happened disclosure-wise in the positive side, in the negative side, Clinton's loss of the presidency was the most negative. She was prepared to disclose. She was setting up for it. It was in the bag. I'd worked two and a half years to try to help that happen. So that whoop, gone. However, something else was happening, and that, of course, is Mr. Tom DeLong. The DeLong situation is fascinating and extremely uh, revealing. Um, and feel, you know, feel free to jump in anytime you got a question. Otherwise, you know me, I'll just go on and on. But, but um, what we know is this. In 2015, Tom, who's always had an interest in the subject, been involved in the past, hadn't gone anywhere, but he reemerged and the interactions developed between he and members of the CIA and the Pentagon. He was pitching them. I think they re reached out to him, but he was reaching out to them. He was pitching them on the idea that they needed uh, to make some effort to get information out uh, and some effort to educate people as to what their role was and what have you, because, you know, they're going to get a bad press on this and they're getting hit pretty hard. Uh, and they liked the idea and meetings were held and so forth. And it was all going on. This is all going on in 2015. He's kind of talking to people here, there, flying all over the country, spending a lot of his money, all good. But the most important thing to note about this is that all the time that he is making these contacts and they are talking to him about what they might do together, almost everyone was under the impression that Hillary Clinton was going to win the White House. And this is significant. Um, not simply because there are people inside that know about the Rockefeller Initiative, not simply because her key, key campaign person and advisor Podesta had been referring to the issue for years, uh, but because PRG, after the citizen hearing on disclosure, launched a very intensive political initiative specifically targeting Hillary Clinton and her campaign. And it began in 2014 when I announced that I was delivering the entire record of the citizen hearing on disclosure through all of the members of Congress. And that's, that 30-hour record included three hours of testimony about the Rockefeller Initiative, of which she or her husband and Podesta, no one has ever referred to, never talked about, only indirectly. And, and so it was on its way to Congress. It was originally going to be sent on the 31st of March of 2014, but at the last minute, I canceled it. But President Clinton, still under the uh, 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 perception that, that, it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it had been delivered, right, sent out the door, arranged to be on Jimmy Kimmel just two days after that shipment was supposed to go out the door, and uh, arranged to be asked an ET question. That was the first real beginning. That's the first beginning of the, the dynamic that took place over the next two years. But the, the citizen hearing on disclosure was not delivered until uh, November 5th, uh, another six months later. And I arrived in Washington. I had some money from the supporters, plus their heart. I think I had about 50000 total. And I got a place. I hired my publicist back on board. And she started approaching the media about the Rockefeller Initiative connection and the E.T. Clinton connection in general. And I started approaching congressional offices to take meetings on the Hill about having some hearings. That was mostly to let the Clintons know we were serious. And that starts in, in, in 2014, mid, mid, uh, mid month. The first breakthrough came with the Washington Times, which I have a pretty good relationship with. And they, they wrote a couple of articles. Uh, referring to Clinton, the kind of ET connection, didn't mention the Rockefeller Initiative. And that got things rolling. And then some more articles turned up in December. And what was happening was I'm getting the calls, I'm talking to the reporters, I'm feeding them information. And what happened was in this second time around in her candidacy, huge election, massive implications, going to cost a billion dollars or more. She started getting calls from reporters. 
and they wanted to know about the Rockefeller Initiative, which they did not want to talk about. And they wanted to know what was John Podesta saying in the past and so forth. And they did not want that. And so they did not respond. They basically stonewalled these reporters with no response. And it's only one exception to that, which they knew was going to incite them even more. Right. And so they had a problem. The, the, the issue of the connection between the Clintons and the extraterrestrial issue had finally caught up with her on her second run for the presidency. And it caught up almost, you know, November is two years before the election. Of course, I know our campaigns these days last forever. And thus began the political initiative that went on all through 2015. The first response from the campaign, as they had to deal with this, they had to do something. They had to do some controlled statements in order to keep the press at bay. And the first one was a tweet from uh, John Podesta, the famous uh, regret tweet, where he he uh, tweeted that he his biggest regret for 2014 was not getting hashtag disclosure of the UFO files. That was on February the 13th of 2015. Now I'm not going to go through all that went on. There were there was over a dozen instances in which she or her, her campaign chairman Podesta addressed this issue, and her husband and Barack Obama. But what's important is that all of this started generating articles by the hundreds. And ultimately, I have uh, linked on my website, which, by the way, the brand new website just went out. We have a few graphic issues, but it's pretty cool. I recommend people check it out, paradigmresearchgroup.org. They, as this is unfolding, Tom DeLong is having his meetings. He's having his interactions with the Pentagon, and they are seeing these articles come out one after another after another uh, about Clinton and his connection. And of course, and she's also, how would you say, she's, not how would you say, she's also ahead of the polls. She's, she's winning against every single other candidate. And so that is the situation in 2015. One solid year of this goes on. And then we enter 2016. Uh, the situation is looking very promising that this story could explode. By the end of 2015, I had 42 reporters on a blind copy list where I'm, I'm, I'm in a regular source relationship with them, including two Pulitzer Prize winners. And so 2016 gets underway. Uh, everything is fine. And that's when Tom DeLong makes his first significant move. DeLong gives an interview in March to, to George Knapp coast-to-coast Sunday show, and I listened to it, and my jaw hit the floor. He basically comes on and says, yep, been talking to people, high-level people in the Pentagon, private meetings. Uh, They want to get information out. We're going to get it out in books, nonfiction, fiction, fiction, documentaries, the whole nine yards. We're going to educate people to this subject, and they have provided me a 10-person advisory team. And And I'm going... Okay, but I'm still thinking, why is the Pentagon making a move this bold with the, an, 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 you know, an intelligent, autodidactic former musician who has some money and a lot of, lot of good cred with, with a younger generation, but why are they doing it? And a lot of people didn't thought it was nonsense. They didn't think it was real. And so that goes down in March. And so on we go through the year. The heat is still turning up on the Clintons. Political initiative is charging away article after article after article. Eventually 400, I think, in English language press, probably another 400 in, in foreign language press. The, the most coverage of the ET issue in political media in history, more coverage in that 24 months than in the previous 68 years prior to that, in the middle of a campaign of that importance. Right. And so, hmm. Are we getting near a break? Are we okay? No, no, we're we're fine. You just keep going. I'm listening. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, the year goes by. I'm still not sure about Tom DeLong, but nevertheless, I'm certainly paying attention. And then all hell starts to break loose, as we all remember quite vividly. Um, and by the way, our elections are just get more entertaining all the time. The 2000 election, George Bush and uh, and Al Gore. That was that was uh, that was Shakespearean theater. Incredible. This I think topped it. So first, the DNC emails get hacked and delivered, put out by WikiLeaks. Embarrassment for some of the Democrats. 
Bernie Sanders people upset definitely hurt her campaign because the Bernie Sanders people needed to come across. That did not help. Uh, but still, she's still winning in the polls. And then, all of a sudden, WikiLeaks comes up with 50,000 emails from John Tedesta's file and starts releasing them, 5,000 at a day. Now, at the same time that happened is when uh, Comey comes out with the uh, statements about relooking at the, uh, the original uh, Clinton problem with the emails and all that. And all of this is, is, is starting to definitely erode her numbers. And uh, things are changing. That, but that was all happening in just a few week period. Up until then, she's winning. And then suddenly, it's not looking so good. But then the Podesta emails come out. And I knew he had ET-related emails in his files. And sure enough, he did about a hundred of them, which I chronicled, put them out on my updates, and they're up on my website right now. You can go read every one of them. Or you can read my commentary and then link over to them because they're still on the net. And in those emails was full confirmation that Tom DeLong was doing what he said he was doing. He was interacting with Podesta. He convinced him to be part of a documentary. He was introducing to some of the hotshots he was dealing with uh, in, his, in, his, in the initiative he was building up. It completely legitimized him, but it wasn't supposed to happen. And some of the people he was involved with, it was a problem for them. So now Tom is completely legitimized, and now I'm going, holy mackerel, this is a big deal. All is moving forward, and I'm, I'm, I'm planning my disclosure party for early in 2018, okay? I mean, I'm looking for caters. I'm, I'm looking for, you know, good prices on nice champagne by the case, whatever the hell. And uh, something unusual happened on the way to the uh, polling booth. She lost. And that blew the whole thing sky high. I mean everything. My initiative, his initiative temporarily, funding dried up, it's over. And I go into deep depression and ultimately flee the country. All right, now, what happens next is extremely interesting. He goes silent for a number of months meaning he's trying to regroup. And as near as I can tell, the principal problem he had was that some of the inside Pentagon people um, were upset when the, 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 the Vodesta emails came out because it kind of put the thing out there before they wanted it to, and there was a potential for some inside exposure. They didn't like that. Plus, they weren't happy with the political situation either, and they dropped out. And so Tom had to reconfigure his project. And it took him a number of months to do this. It took him eight, nine, almost nine months to do this. And he, he started mentioning that things were coming together. He was saying, hey, wait for it's coming. People were getting a little irritated because he kept putting them off. But nevertheless, on December the 16th, he makes his move and drops an absolute nuclear bomb. So what happens on the 16th of December? Well, they do a face video introduction of the To the Stars Academy team. It's not a press conference. They're not pushing it hard. They're basically saying, hey, here's what we're doing, right? Pay attention. And so if those of you who have not watched that, if you've even watched it once, watch it a second time. Go back and listen to every single word of that, I don't know, 25-minute presentation where they bring to the world the To the Stars Academy. Now, Tom does the introduction. He's, he's the He's the... He's the showman. He's the, he's the kind of the leader of the band, but he's not the heavy hitters. The heavy hitters are on the team. And so he, in, he, he, he has some of the people, not all of them, up on the stage. And the first person that speaks after Tom does the intro is Chris Mellon. And he essentially basically ignites the fuse, right? He, in other words, and there, there's multiple things going on, and one of the most important is when Chris Mellon steps up to that podium and gives his introduction to what's going on. And how does he do it? Wow. What he does immediately launches in to a chronological account of the relatively well-known Nimitz Aircraft Carrier Task Force event 2004 that occurred between San Diego and Mexico's Coronado Island. What happened there is the, the, the task force, just some of the, before the carrier showed up, some of the destroyers, uh, we're picking up bogeys. They were picking up some very unusual UAPs. And then when the Nimitz showed up, they launched a couple of F-18s, and they went up there, and he runs through this whole process, what happened, what they saw, and all of this, and makes it crystal clear that this was not a human craft. 
Now, his background is heavy, heavy background. He's, he's all over politics, inside, outside. And then the, everybody else on that team has got a heavy background. But he is the initial guy, and essentially he fronts the whole thing and says, there was an event, it was an Nimitz event, it was extraterrestrial. And I'm going, holy mackerel. And then the other people spoke. None of them disagreed with them. None of them uh, demurred. They do the 16 minutes. They announce the Public Service Corporation. Very smooth move on their part. It allows people to get involved, be players, be part of it. And, uh, and it was an excellent test of what the reception would be. What was the reception? And they raised $2 million in about two or three months. right? And I think they capped off the first escrow at $2.5 million. That shows the public is really interested if something solid, something important is in front of them. So all of that goes down on December the 16th. A lot of people immediately started to attack him, the usual people with the usual uh, uh, skepticism and what have you. But I knew how big that event was. And so I'm now waiting for what's his next move. Right. And keep in mind, they waited until December, right? And there's a reason mm -hmm. for that, I believe. So what I'm, I am very sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. I've got my time scheme. The, the, the announcement of the To The Stars Academy was October 11th. Yes. All right. Uh, October 11th. So I don't want to, I'm sorry if I confused anybody. And so they do that and then kind of go silent, right? Not much going on. Don't hear from them. And what's the next, the next move? And let me tell you, all of this is being carefully, strategically done. And there's very good reasons for that. They are trying to build up a stream, high-level media interest. And the way you do that is you don't show all your cards, right, and go, wow, look what a great hand I have, and then, and, and then leave the room. The media will do some stories, and then they go back to sleep. You've got to keep giving them meat. You've got to throw that meat on the table. This is what happened with the Lewinsky scandal. Uh, something kept coming up every month and a half, and by the, after about six or seven uh, of, uh, of that type of thing, the media, everybody's hair was on fire. And they're running all over Washington, D.C. with trucks and cameras and everything else. That's strategy, and that's what they're doing. So what happens next? Well, we all know what happens next. The New York Times writes a story. Now, let's be clear. The New York Times did not run this story to ground. They handed it to them. They served it up on a platter, which is fine. No problem. And so the story comes out, two articles, December the 16th. Now, the first article is, is written by Leslie Kane, who has got a pretty strong inside connection on this and well-respected plays it pretty safe. She's not like me. She's not a political activist. I'm pretty aggressive in, in, my, in my views and statements on this. And, but it's co-written by uh, Helen, Helene, oh, I forget her last name. I, I forgive me, Helene. And Ralph Blumenthal, who was a 40-year career journalist with, with, with a Pulitzer Prize and a Pulitzer Prize nomination. Now, I know some things about Ralph I don't really want to get into because it's, it's kind of like he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want it out yet. But let's just say that he's going to be a player. And so they hit this, this article hits with a companion article, right? And it lands like a bomb, right? And why? <laughs> well, first of all, it's the New York Times. Secondly, it's a very long article. But what is in this article? My God, stuff that I didn't know, and I don't think many people knew at all. What does this article say? It says, right, that, a, that, that, that Harry Reid, because he was a, the Senate Majority Leader and had some clout and was prompted by somebody I'm going to talk about in a minute who may be the key person to all of this, went to the Pentagon and said, you guys need to start studying this phenomenon again. It's too important. The Pentagon, of course, was in an awkward position. The Pentagon has been studying the ET phenomena 24 and 7, 365 days a year, for the last 70 years, okay, they just don't broadcast that. It's in USAP programs, lots of them. So they can't say, well, you know, Harry, we're already kind of doing that. No, no, no. They go, oh, really? And he says, you know, you haven't done anything since 1969. And so they had a problem. And they had to basically say, okay, Harry, no problem. We need some money. He says, I'm going to earmark some money, right? Going to do it quietly. Gonna, not going to raise a lot of, lot of you know, dust about this. Uh, so it'll be kind of a private program. 22 million bucks over, you know, 5 million a year. And so they reluctantly, I am almost certain reluctantly, put this program together and they put Luis Elizondo in charge of it. Pretty high level hitter, big background, right? And very interested in the subject. Love to ask him why that is. I can guess. The point is, is that this program starts in 2007 
and goes on for five years and nobody knows about it. All right? And then it's ended in 2012. We learned that. But Elizondo is so into it, he stays on, even though there's no money for it, and probably just does what he can for the next five years. So we learned that. All right? And what else do we learn? Well, what we learn is that the person that got a lot of the money, most of that $22 million, was none other than Robert Bigelow, aerospace entrepreneur, engineer. We all have heard about Robert Bigelow. We all know that he has a picture of an E.T. on the side of one of his buildings. But here's something else we know. Because, as I said, this was an interesting year. A couple months after Tom DeLong makes his announcement of the To The Stars Academy, Bigelow is interviewed on 60 Minutes because NASA has finally given him the, you know, the crown jewel of, of his huge effort going back to <clears throat> 2000 to try to build space, flexible space habitats. Not rockets like SpaceX and stuff, which is interesting since chemical rockets is old technology now, but, you know, really valuable stuff. These flexible habitats could be incredibly useful. And they, NASA finally, after he's under contract with NASA for many years, they agreed to test one on the ISS. Well, that's a big deal. And so 60 Minutes says we should interview Bob Bigelow, which they did. And 60 Minutes is one of the most watched shows in the world. Now... They went to see him at his, at his uh, aerospace facilities, and it is totally understandable that they provided him the topics that they were going to address. They don't submit the questions, not, not 60 minutes, not at that level. And he doesn't tell them what he wants them to ask, but they, they say, we're going to talk about this and this and this, Bob. Give him a heads up. Okay, fine. And not surprisingly, one of those was the UFO issue, or what I call the ET issue, because his involvement is known. It, it, his involvement with MUFON is known, NIDS is known, so everybody knows that Bob has an interest there. Okay, fine. And so they go through the interview and they walk around the facilities and talk about the, the space uh, habitat and, and all of that. And then finally, toward the end, this nice lady uh, asks about the UFO issue, not knowing what the answer is going to be. And what was the answer that he had very carefully prepared, you can be sure, in advance. He hits her right in the kisser and says, there's extraterrestrials here. Her response was not surprising. It was, uh, uh, mm, uh, well, uh, uh, Bob, do you think uh, there might people think you're a little, little off or crazy or whatever she said uh, for saying something like that? And he then responded with the second most famous line of its type. The first one was by Clark Gable in the uh, legendary movie Gone with the Wind. As he's leaving Vivian Lee at the very end, he immediately looks at her and says, I don't give a damn. Now think about that. A billionaire with huge NASA contracts involved in space research just told a 60 Minutes reporter, I don't give a damn if people think my statement about ETs being here bothers them. She then comes back at him again. I mean, she had to and tries to get a second response. And once again, he confirms, yes, they're already here. This was a big deal, but most people didn't understand how big or why. But that was Bigelow, a few months after Tom DeLong does his thing. Now, one might conclude that, well, it's kind of separate, right? I mean, Big's doing his thing. He's angry. He's frustrated that the truth embargo is going on. When he knows if it ended, the, uh, his space research would probably get 10 times more money, and all of his dreams would come true, and he's mad and he's irritated. Yeah. But wait a minute. When the New York Times article is published on December the 16th, what do we learn? One of Tom's people, Elizondo, was running the program and then retired from the DOD specifically to join up with To The Stars Academy. And who was the man that prompted Harry Reid to start the, the research or put a research program at the Pentagon? Bigelow, right? And who was, who was doing a lot of the research on the outside? Bigelow. Who set up a facility to look at uh, materiel? And when, I, when he's saying materiel, he's not talking arts parts. 
this would have been material provided to them by the Pentagon, probably in order to keep Harry Reid happy. Take a look at this, because, you know, this material is not the kind of thing that's going to blow disclosure out of the water right away. It takes a long time. And he's doing that. In other words, this is orchestrated. Tom does his thing. Bigelow goes on 60 Minutes and says they're already here. And then the announcement is fed, you know, that story is fed to the New York Times. Bigelow is then out as the guy behind that program, right? And all of a sudden, we got billionaires saying there's ETs here. We got former, you know, high level space guys connected to top level politicians saying there's ETs here. And then just to put a nice cherry on the top of this Sunday, they do the extra article in which. And what is the focus of that article, which thanks to the fact that, you know, all articles go on the web as well as in print. In print, you can't see a UAP gun camera footage, but you sure as hell can see it on the New York Times website. And so they do the article about Fravor, who was one of the F-18 pilots that intercept the Nimitz UAP. And they run that thing. Well, that video was turning up all over the world. You couldn't, you couldn't land on a, on a news site, and there was that video. So wait a minute, what's that about? Well, let me tell you what that's about. And I've talked about this many times, all right? And that is this. Every single country that has an Air Force going back to the 1940s has been sending up planes to intercept these UAPs. And I'm not talking about kites. I'm not talking about funny clouds or a comet going over or contrails. I'm talking about UAPs, highly maneuverable craft that they can't possibly keep up with. And when they do it, they take gun camera footage of it. They have to. You don't send up for a, a planes to intercept a bogey that could be a, a, an experimental craft, could be a foreign craft, could be an airliner, and, and you might even shoot it down, and you, you just, you know, you have the pilot come back and draw you a picture. And so every country with an Air Force has got stacks of gun camera footage sitting in their vaults in service to the truth embargo because these people or these countries have decided to go along with the United States policy and not a single inch of it has been revealed. And you could file FOIAs until the end of, well, till you're blue in the face, you're not going to get an, an inch of it. Why? Because if they started releasing that, it would end the truth embargo. Now, just to be, you know, to be thorough, there is possibly a situation where the gun camera footage from Nimitz might have accidentally been released to a, a documentary team by somebody that didn't know quite what they were doing, and, and a little of it showed up in a doc a number of years ago, maybe 2007, but it was an official release. And so this was an official release because Elizondo, when he retired, asked permission to take three footages with him, three videos. And I believe they're all gun camera footage. And he was given that permission. So this was an official release for the first time in 70 years since Roswell of gun camera footage of a UAP intercept. And it was a beauty. And there it was in the New York Times with the pilot, of course, interviewed just to make sure people didn't think that, I don't know, they hoaxed it up just to have fun. This was a huge thing. It was a message to every country in the world. You know, things are starting to change here. And, the, and what it confirmed is what I had suspected and a lot of other people have suspected, that the cover-up is starting to break apart inside first. It's probably loosening up inside more than it is outside. And that some groups inside the Pentagon and the CIA who have enough clout have decided to make some careful moves without violating the security oaths, without breaking the law, and bringing the wrath of God down on them, and starting to loosen this thing up. Bigelow was given the uh, license for that. Tom DeLong was given the license for that. Elizondo, Fravor, all of them. Because I can assure you, if the Pentagon did not want Elizondo to walk out the door with three pieces of gun camera footage, it sure as hell wouldn't have happened. And so now you've got that. Right. And that all happens on December the 16th. It generated 150-some articles. I have links to all of them on my website, as well as like 15, 16 videos. But one of my contacts says he has 60 news videos, or videos, rather, from news coverage of that report and the Fravor sighting. And I'm going to eventually get all 60 of them, get them on my website. 
So that was December the 16th. So now you're starting to see the outline of something very big going down, and Tom DeLong has made it clear that there's going to be another big announcement pretty soon. Meanwhile, Elizondo started giving interviews all over the news. Right? Um, Blumenthal gave an interview. And for the first time ever, on the 26th of December, I'm sorry, the 26th of January, Hal Putoff, the legendary Hal Putoff, turns up and gives an interview on Coast to Coast. And they've got six or seven more guys there to start getting interviews, but they're taking their time. Now, let me make it very clear to your listeners. The truth embargo, and it's all, and it's all mighty glory, cannot sustain much more of this. It simply cannot. Something is going to have to give. So, but it gets even more interesting because when you start looking at all the players and I'll be doing a full blog piece. I have a blog now. It's on the new website. I'll be doing an extensive blog on this. But there are a number of groups that, are, that I consider to be part of this unfolding process. One of is the Clinton team, I call it. It goes all the way back to the Rockefeller Initiative. Right? The people around Hillary Clinton, that's one team. The second one is the Two of the Stars Academy team. Right? We've got those. And then... There is a, uh, a third group that centers around Bigelow and NIDS, right? NIDS goes back to, I think he, I think he sort of very initially started in 1995, but it, it got off slow. I think it didn't really pick up speed to about 2000. So you've got the NIDS team. And I, ha I have listed these people, and there's some very interesting connections, right? Why? John Podesta is part of the Clinton team going back to the Rockefeller Initiative. But John Podesta is also part of the, to, uh, to, to the DeLong project. Because remember, he agreed to cooperate with DeLong. He gave him interviews. He was exchanging emails. So he's in both of those. Hal Putoff was on uh, uh, Robert Bigelow's NIDS board. Hal Putoff is on DeLong's team. There is another connection, right? Bigelow, of course, is on all three. Bigelow was part of the Rockefeller Initiative. Bigelow is clearly connected to DeLong's initiative. And, of course, Bigelow is, you know, founded NIDS and has been now speaking out publicly. So he is connected to all three of these groups, right? There's other connections. Com Kelleher. Com Kelleher is on the DeLong team. Com Kelleher was the chief scientist for Bob Bigelow's NIDS team and so forth. And I'm looking for more of these kind of connections, but you can see these groups are cross-connected. So it is out of these groups primarily that we're starting to see the movement and the strategy developing. And I expect more players to turn up, and they may have some connections, uh, and, and so forth. So that gives you a sense of the power of what is unfolding, really going back to when Tom DeLong, after you know, making some, you know, uh, hints and out, you know, and stuff, talking about what he's doing, turns up and gives that interview to George Knapp. But there is a fourth component here, which uh, I'm going to have to toot my horn a little on, that is non-trivial, right? And what is this component? The component is Vladimir Putin. Now, a lot of people in the audience are saying, why is Vladimir? I mean, we've heard so much about Vladimir. Why is he in everything? What's going on? What's going on with this? Right, here's what's going on. Going all the way back to 2000, at least. I've done, well, going back to 97, I've done over 1,200 interviews easily, uh, mostly internet radio or some terrestrial radio, some top TV, but you know, mostly internet. I, 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 I've, I've really used the internet radio uh, genre to the maximum. And so, I, and all these, in these interviews, in hundreds of them, I did something very deliberate, and that is I kept bringing up the fact that the President of the United States was not the only head of state to get in the truth embargo, that others could do it at any time. There were a number of candidates, but the prime one was Vladimir Putin. Now, the reason I was saying this was, one, to send a message to Vladimir Putin, you know, in case he happens to be listening to Spaced Out Radio or whatever, uh, but also to send a message to the White House and the Pentagon 
uh, fellas, try to uh, remember that you're not the only game in town. And unless Vladimir Putin is on your payroll, he could pop the cork on this bottle of champagne 1947 anytime he wants to. So I did that year after year after year. Okay, fine. Right. Well, when I came over to London uh, in 2017 for what ended up being seven, seven months, while I was here, the first time, I had two trips. One was a month and a half, one was six months. I got a call from a Russian network, uh, one of their national networks, REN TV. They want to interview me in London. I said, no, I, I won't interview you unless it's in Moscow. And they said, fine, you can pay your way. We'll interview you here. And so I went to Moscow on March, May the 3rd. And I did an hour and a half extensive interview that they used a little bit of for one of their programs. But I eventually got the... Uh, what I call the raw version. It was, it's not the deluxe version. It's not the high end. It's kind of the basic version that was being done on site on one of the cameras. But I got the whole thing. And I started releasing parts of it. Uh, in September, October of last year. Uh, and now all, all 10 parts are up. But the core part of the interview, I did not release. Why? Because in that 30-minute central piece of that interview in Moscow, I did something that no one has ever done before. And that is, uh, though I had talked about Putin many times on American media, I discussed Putin, Russia, exopolitics, and the pros and cons of him being the first disclosure president on Russian media, and no one had ever done this, let alone on Russian soil. And more importantly, later that week, I, I had six meetings with six different groups that are kind of dealing with the ET issue. All of, all of those groups contain people who had worked for the Soviet and the Russian government on this subject, who are now, how would you say, retired. Does that sound familiar? Elizondo, Semivan, Khan, right? And so, you, know, so, so, you know, one of them was like a top guy in the Foreign Service Department there. So, you know, we couldn't, it wasn't, you know, a big deal. I mean, I, I got five people in front of me. I got a, a reasonably good, but not great, translator and we're trying to converse and so it wasn't big it was a get to know how you doing but that's not why i did it why i did it was if i knew i knew if i gave those six those uh, six meetings took place the kremlin would know i was there and they didn't already and that's what i wanted to have not 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 the least being the cia okay so that all takes place may of last year i will assume it was known amongst the people that know these things but i did not really talk about it much i've strung it out all right, well, I just released the, the core 30 minutes as a press release went out last night. So it's in play right now. It's controversial. I hope it gets me on CNN, you know? You know, I'm not asked to go on those shows much anymore because I don't go on and play games. I don't go on and hedge and, and, and dodge and weave. I go on and just flat out say there's an extraterrestrial president, and that just drives them crazy. They don't bite me on. But, you know, uh, this, this might be the trick in any event. All of this is unfolding in 2017, all right? And so at the same time that DeLong is talking to the Pentagon, working out the program, getting ready to make the announcement, the same time the CIA is about to release um, um, Elizondo, I think it was Elizondo, oh, no, it was DOD, he retired from there. I think it was Khan that retired from, from uh, or uh, might have been uh, Justice, whatever, and these people are deciding to leave and go with Tom DeLong. I'm in Russia trying to cause trouble. Now, why is this important? It's important because one of the reasons I believe that they have made these moves now in 2017, in spite of the fact that the politics in America is the most bizarre, chaotic, disruptive, screwed up, in my lifetime, surpassing even the worst of, of the Vietnam War, where things were not good, but at least they were sane, it's just crazy. It's a 17-ring circus going on. There's clown cars everywhere. And, yet, and they held off. They held off for months and months, and finally they, they, they went ahead, even though the circumstances are not ideal. Why did they do that? And it's called the Rosie Ruiz effect. All right? You have a fairly young audience, perhaps, and they may not know who Rosie Ruiz is, but she's very famous. Who is Rosie Ruiz? Well, she is a woman back in the 80s. I think it was early 80s. I can't remember the exact date. I need to, go to, I need to Google that. 
who, who signed up for the Boston Marathon, got the bib, got the shorts, got all the stuff, went down, right, at the start, takes off, quickly disappears, grabs a cab, takes a cab down to the finish line, and about 1,000 yards before the lead woman crosses the finish line, jumps into the race, crosses the line, and gets crowned the winner of the Boston Marathon. Well, she had a problem, though. Her calves, I'm afraid, did not match or measure up. And so a lot of the pros there were looking at her calves and going, there's no way a woman with those calves won the Boston Marathon. And so they started checking some videos, and they discovered, yes, yeah, she jumped in at the last minute. And it's, she's famous, and it's all funny games. The sad thing is that the, um, the woman that did win the Boston Marathon you know, some 40, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, nobody remembers her. So why am I bringing up Rosie Ruiz? Very simple. As the disclosure process moves forward, now increasingly in an American context, the temptation for a Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping, but particularly Putin, to jump in at the last minute and cross the finish line grows and grows with each passing day. And so my message to the Pentagon and my message uh, essentially in these videos and the interview that I did is to keep reminding them that you guys may have your pace. You may have your plans. We're getting a little soft disclosure here, a little program with Tom. Then, you know, we'll serve up some chocolate cake and whatever. And sometime in 2020, this is all going to come to a head. The president's going to announce. I'm saying, uh, guys and girls, Vladimir Putin, who right now is eating our lunch and our breakfast and most of our dinner, can pull the rug out from under us at any time, announce the ET presence of his people, take the entire political legacy to himself, and leave the entire Pentagon and the CIA in the United States with a whole bunch of egg on its face, having to clean up the mess that we have made without any glory of being the great truth-telling nation. That's what's going on. That's the big picture. I'm, I appreciate your patience in letting me describe this. Not a problem. Uh, I to answer your question, sir. Whatever you got, fire away. Well, we have about four minutes before we got to go to our first break here, and we got you for one hour. So in hour number two, I'm going to be hitting you up with a lot of questions regarding this. Now, I am one of the ones, Steve, I have no problem going on record that... I have been critical about some of the things the To The Stars campaign in this entire process has brought out because I do think there are some legitimate questions that need to be asked and many in this field are not getting the opportunity to ask those questions. Do you believe then that Tom DeLong and the entire To The Stars crew are actually doing this for the benefit of mankind, or do you think it's all about their egos along with Robert Bigelow's? I, I don't like the word ego. Let's put that aside for a second. Um, I believe that, yeah, look, the people that work at the Pentagon and the CIA are good people. Their job is to protect the United States, and that's exactly what they do. They get paid well, but they're not rich, Right. Uh, if they if they don't jump out and do more in the open, it's because they're under strict, you know, legal restraints and non-disclosures and what have you. Even even if they're not in the military, and, but they they they, are, they can they sometimes can do some things. And right now they're doing a lot. Okay. So yes, they are ultimately serving the public. However, they're also serving themselves. And when you and, and if you were to go back and listen at length to Tom DeLong's interview with Knapp. And then he did, he's done another one since. L listen to a couple of them, but listen to the Knapp interview from 2016. What you will hear is basic, it can be characterized this way. If you want to, if you want to sort of put a, a, a characterization on what Tom is ultimately doing, and I'm, and I'm not being disrespectful here at all, He's essentially acting as a PR guy for the Pentagon. He is trying to help them get out information that shows a number of things, not the least of which is they're not the bad guys. They've been trying to do their best. They had to use, they had to consider this a potential threat. They've handled it within you know, reasonable legal restraints. And so they're trying to, they're inoculating themselves against the problems and the PR problems they're going to have if, if any president, any head of state finally announces the ET presence, the whole thing goes up. 
Uh, so there's a PR thing. So in that sense, they're serving themselves. But I don't blame them. That's what I would do. My God, you know, who wants I mean, this? Is, the, the, the disclosure is going to be the biggest event in human history. And the focus on it is going to be beyond anything you've ever seen in your life. It'll make the Lonica Lewinsky thing look like chump change, right? I'm talking focus at magnitudes never seen before. And so every little thing that you've said and done and tweeted and posted and everything else, people are going to be jumping on it. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? It's not going to be easy for them. But so they're trying to sort of not make themselves a little bit. They're trying to sh show what they can, that they're not the bad guys. And so I do see that. All right. But overall, I believe what, going, what is going on now is legit, relatively straightforward, honest, and is intended ultimately to serve the American people. You don't do that, though, Stephen. And I'm, we only got about 30 seconds here, and then we'll carry this over. But I guess my opinion is you don't do this by controlling the media, which they have done. They have controlled whom that group is allowed to talk to. They have controlled, you know, they know to their benefit that they caught the mainstream media off guard because the mainstream media, as you know, has never wanted to take this subject seriously. So the mainstream is throwing a bunch of softballs, and I'll get more into that. Right after this, we are going to go to our first break of the night. Steve Bassett is with us for one more hour to talk about disclosure. Hour number three from the Paranormal Code. We got Rich Giordano coming on up. You're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. It's going to be an exciting hour number two. Stick around. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. EscapeWatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Lorian Fenton here, SOR listeners. Join me at UFOCon 2018 in South San Francisco, California, March 23rd through 25th, where 14 presenters discuss all things disclosure, UFOs, and aliens. Stephen Bassett, Grant Cameron, and Melinda Leslie address disclosure. Preston Dennett will present Inside UFOs. Your Dave Scott and Lynn Buchanan tell of amazing alien contact. Get tickets at caufocon.com. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social Media Freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Coming September 28th to the 30th, it's our first annual Caribou Paracon, put on by Spaced Out Radio and the Canadian Society of Questers. Three days of paranormal, supernatural, and spiritual knowledge in the beautiful 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Tickets are $150 Canadian for the event, being held at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Come watch our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Lorian Fenton, David Weatherly, Ross Allison, and more. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. Hey, space travelers. It's Joe Roop, your host of Spaced Out Saturdays. Come join me as we explore the realms of the paranormal, the esoteric, and everything in between every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. You know the truth is out there. Don't get caught sleepwalking. Come join Spaced Out Saturdays. That's every Saturday night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, right here on SpacedOutRadio.com. Psychic Sundays, spiritual communication, ET contact, Sasquatch in your backyard. We will have it all on Cosmic Passport with me, Elizabeth Anglin. Each Sunday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, at SpacedOutRadio.com. I will take you on a journey of enlightenment. The goal is learning from the soul on out. We'd love it if you joined our experience, Cosmic Passport, heard Sundays at spacedoutradio.com. 
365 days a year, we're in the field, investigating UFO sightings, talking to alien abductees, and visiting secret military locations like Area 51. We're UFO Seekers, official partner of Spaced Out Radio. Follow our daily search for the truth at ufoseekers.com or like us on social media. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. From coast to coast to coast, Black Light Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, we're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Want to learn more about aliens, cover-ups, conspiracies, cryptids, and the paranormal? All you have to do is tune in S4 as we take over the Spaced Out Radio Night, starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, each and every Saturday night, right after Spaced Out Saturdays. Hi there, this is Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. Join me, Corey Ruiz, and friends as we discuss the hot topics of the night. It's fun, entertaining, and as dark as the night. Find us at spacedoutradio.com. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? If you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media, then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back to the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, we finish off the week with a little alien talk. Our Keith Andrews. I know everybody on Twitter is going to be excited about that. Yes, our Keith Andrews is back for the ET Connection. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key Down in Noonan, Georgia, home of The Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are also live on the Fringe FM. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to revolution.radio and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Flavicomus, 
Flavicomus is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, space travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, you can watch us live right now on Periscope.tv. We are also on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, follow me at Dave Scott, SOR. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. That's youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And I will graciously accept your subscription to our channel. Absolutely. We're on iHeartRadio in the United States. Talk stream live. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download and subscribe to our shows on iTunes. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month, rock out to some Bumblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. You can also read up on the encounter online and watch great videos from UFO Seekers and Contact TV and so much more. Tonight, we are talking with Steve Bassett from the Paradigm Research Group. He is a fan of Disclosure, has been lobbying for more than 25 years in Washington, D.C. to get politicians, the military, and whomever will listen to him to talk about UFOs. Well, now it's happening, and now Steve is back with us. Steve, welcome back. Yes, sir. Before we get back into the disclosure, I, I do have to say that I am very excited at meeting up with you in San Francisco, March 23rd to 25th for UFO Con 2018, where, you know, we're going to be able to share a beer, share a few laughs, and, you know, talk about some disclosure at Lorian Fenton's fantastic event, one of the biggest in the country. You excited about that? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I've done the UFO Con before. I'll be there at the Friday speakers get together, meet and greet, and then I'm coming back to do the closing keynote on Sunday. Um, and that's that's going to be great. And uh, you know, it's, it's in a nice, it's in South San Francisco, at a pretty nice hotel. I hope people will come and participate. Um, but I got to tell you, I'm also speaking in a few days at the Conscious Life Expo. I'll be giving, I think, two or three presentations as part of that. And then I am going to be doing like three or four presentations at the, uh, well, maybe two or three, at the International UFO uh, Congress Conference, the big one in Phoenix at Indian Wells. And that's uh, February 14 to 18. And at that conference, at my presentation, I am going to be making a fairly significant announcement. So anybody that can make it uh, to Phoenix for that weekend, uh, I hope you'll drop in for my presentation there. I will also be doing at least three presentations at the Contact in the Desert, June 1 to 4. I'm also going to be in Barcelona, July, and then there's a Turkey conference coming together and so forth. I think I've got 11 conferences lined up. Why? I, I'm, you know, why is everybody calling me this year? I think I know why. You know, <laughs> you know why this? And again, I owe this all to Tom DeLong, right? It's like, it's uh, bless his heart. You know, he's 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 the guy, right? And everybody wants to to, to talk to Tom DeLong. They, they want him on their show. They want him to come. Well, Tom is operating at a pretty high level. I mean, there's rumors he's already talking to Steven Spielberg. So he's talking to some high-level Hollywood people and so forth. And so, you know, they just can't get Tom DeLong. And so they're going, well, you know, this thing is hook disclosure is cooking. Right, and uh, who can we get? <laughs> well, there's that Bassett guy. <laughs> you know, he's he's always available. Call him. So I'm getting these calls. But let me elaborate on this because just to give you a sense of how things are going down. I can't, I'm not going to name the names here because that would be inappropriate, and and I don't and and, and I, I haven't been asked to do that. But just before I left London a few days ago, I get a call from a company that's done a number of uh, of. Uh, of, uh, 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 you know, uh, reality shows. Not the famous ones, but quite a few. The different networks, History Channel, whatever. And they called me up and they said, well, they me, emailed me and then I talked to him on the phone. He said, well, you know, one of our clients approached us just recently uh, and said, and I, I knew it had to be the History Channel, and said, well, uh, we're thinking about maybe doing a reality show or doing a show about disclosure. <laughs> And I'm going, oh, really? Right? 
Oh, so it's like these, these, uh, some of these venues are starting to figure out disclosures where it's at and not just talking about you know, the, the sightings from 45 years ago. And so we talked about the pros and cons of doing that and whatever, and that's fine. Two days later, I got a call from a major company, right, that everybody's name, everybody would know their name, and they've been very successful. And I didn't get a call. I got an email. And we exchanged emails, and I'm going to be talking to them soon. And the gist of it was, well, <clears throat> one of our clients, and it was certainly the History Channel again, uh, wants us to do a, like a, maybe a two, two-part series on disclosure. <laughs> and we, we want to interview you. And so I'm going, you know, I think I see the picture here. Um, and guess what, uh, Dave? The heat is, is turning up on the pot. And a, a lot of venues, whether it's television, documentary, Leslie Kane's got a doc that she's working on now. She's got some good Hollywood people involved. There's a, there's a documentary a series being put together on J. Allen Hynek. Uh, Robert Zemeckis is already working on a documentary narrative series for Netflix on Blue Book. When all these venues start to realize what the hell is actually coming down the tracks here, it is going to be, uh, it's going to be pretty intense. All right, because people know about ETs. They know about sightings. They've been seen it a zillion times. But disclosure, as it starts to get legitimized more and more and more, that's a whole nother ballgame. So uh, I'll be there at UFOCon. I'll see you then. And uh, I'll be at a lot of other events this year. And if you go to Paradigm Research Group, of course, I have all that out there. Right before the break, I had asked you about the way that whether it's a to the stars or the media it, or uh, the government is controlling the media in this subject. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm not saying this just because nobody from To The Stars has got back to this show. It has nothing to do with my show. It has a lot to do sure. with every other show that uses this type of programming that they are not making themselves accessible to, let alone other researchers. The mainstream media, in my opinion, as someone who's worked in it, was really caught off guard with this story because they have been extremely fickle and careless about people who have had experiences with UFOs and or aliens over the years. They make fun of us. So when this story came out, which I'm going to preface, I think is fantastic. I really do believe it was time to finally, you know, start setting some records straight on this. However, I do have concerns on behalf of my fellow researchers and media members in the alternative where they are ignoring media requests from the alternative side. Do you think sure. that's fair, or do you think that's just part of the ploy? <laughs> well, first of all, let us let's let us agree that life is not fair. I, uh, I, I think when I was 19, I thought maybe it was fair. I'm 71 now, and I can tell you with absolute certainty, life is not fair. Okay, let me put that aside for a second. But I know a lot about the media. That's been the principal focus of my work. I, 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 I learned early on that lobbying Congress was like bouncing a ping pong ball off a cement dam. I mean, it, it's just it, it, Congress is already solidifying back in the mid 90s and it's only gotten worse than worse. But the media, the media is much more available in a sense. And I've been lobbying. I know a lot about them. And here is the way it works. And, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about the media, particularly in this current political climate. Um, the media is constantly being manipulated by, by entities, government, business, corporations, nonprofits, anybody that, that wants something out there. They're, they're constantly being manipulated. It doesn't mean they succumb to it, but that, that's, the way, and that's, that's part of the deal. That's, that's understood, understood. The media, on the other hand, is constantly wants to get information from lots of entities, business, government, what have you. And so they need their cooperation on things that they're working on. And so there's a lot of quid pro quo that goes on. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. A lot of, some people think the media just sits around waiting for something to happen, right? Just something blows up, something happens, and then they rush out and do the news. That's, not, that, that's a fraction of the news. Like recently, we had our 447,000th uh, school shooting. I think it was uh, yesterday, Castro area of Los Angeles, two kids killed by a 12-year-old girl. 
and just another typical day in America. And now that's a lot of news, but that's to me is much more than that. And so the way it works is this. You've got something that you think is important and you want to get it out. You decide who do you want to approach? What's the proper venue? All right. Uh, where, where do you think it'll best receive? And then you, you get in touch and you tell them, here's what's going on. Here's what you got. Right? So let's take, the, let's take the Nimitz thing, the Nimitz event and Fravor and that story, which I'm pretty sure that the Delong team uh, you know, set up for a New York Times article. They, they could have taken it to the, the Weekly World News, I suppose. They could have taken it to Pravda RU. But you're not just going to walk into any media and say, yeah, no, they're going to try to take it where they think will have the most power. And so they went to the New York Times. Well, guess what? That's not controlling the New York Times. The New York Times could have said, no, we're not going to do it. And it happens all the time. They're constantly approached by people that think they've really got a big story. And they go, I don't think so. And they don't write it up. So there's nothing unusual about that. All right, point number one. Point number two. What's going on here is pretty high-level stuff. This is big, big deal. And it's incredibly complicated, and the history of the whole thing is complicated. And one of the most important things that people keep forgetting, and I have to keep reminding them, is this has not been a legitimate game. This has been a rigged game from the beginning. The U.S. government made a decision to suppress, deny, lie, subvert, and misinform on this issue for national security reasons. In other words, what you know, it, it, you know at the very earliest days, think of the ET thing as it unfolded as a crystal pure lake, right? You could just see right through down to the bottom, and amazing things are going to be found in that lake. And the government didn't want that to happen, so they started pumping pollution into that lake. And so they polluted it to the point where it wasn't drinkable. And it created a lot of pain and suffering for a lot of people. They ghettoized the entire UFO field and everybody in it. You want to you wanna touch UFOs? Fine, but you got to put a little saucer, you know, uh, embroider a little saucer thing in your shirt so everybody knows you're a UFO person so we can ridicule you. Does that sound familiar? It's called intellectual ghettoization. So... It's not Tom DeLong's fault or my fault or anybody's fault that the government chose to do this. They did it, and they created a pretty much more complicated, difficult arena to operate in. And so if you are, if you are involved in an interaction with high-level people in the Pentagon, in the CIA, even with NASA connections, who are, going to, who are trying to make some maneuvers right, that could bring this issue to another level, but they have serious concerns about breaking the law, about non-disclosure, and so forth. I don't think it's a good idea for you to, right out of the gate, start embracing the plethora of alternative media. That is not where you want to be, because the alternative media is a very messy place. doesn't mean that people aren't trying hard, doesn't mean they're doing the best they can, but you, you, that's not where you go. You go to the New York Times. If the New York Times had said no, you go to the Washington Post. And if they said no, you go to the Boston Globe. And if everybody says no, I guess you haven't got much of a story. But let's face it, they I had a that. major I understand yeah. that they had a and major so story. And, but yeah. when they have trotted out, okay, after the To the Stars, uh, after the New York Times article where they started trotting out Luis Elizondo everywhere, Chris Mellon everywhere, other people involved. Yes, they did the major media circuit, which I think is fantastic. However, with not being very studious on this subject, when it comes to disclosure, the major media, has, all they have done is thrown softball questions to these guys because they were caught with their pants down on a topic that they never had to care about. And I've worked in newsroom, and and I've worked in newsroom. So it's an absolute perfect fit because here they are, and I and trust me, I know I'm not CNN. I know I'm not Fox News. I know other shows that are not up there either on the alternative side. And I'm not saying doing every blog talk radio or Spreaker type show. I get that. I understand that with these these are real major people. However, when you are 
strictly categorizing your information to certain members of the alternative media, like the other show, and their members, and you are denying other requests by not even responding to press releases when -hmm. people are trying to do the right thing and treat their outlet like a media outlet. And I know numerous people in this field who have not been received via email or phone call any sort of contact from this group after asking for press coverage or to conduct an interview. That's where the problem starts. That, to me, as a journalist, if I put my mainstream hat on, is a red flag. And it's not a good red flag. I don't know if it's a red flag, but it is a reflection of the nature of how these things go down and how they're played out. Um, I think you make a couple of points there. One, uh, again, this is a relatively highly orchestrated process that's underway. They're picking their spots. They're going to call the shots as much as they can, which you always try to do. Everybody tries to do that, particularly in politics. You're always picking your spots, the person, the paper. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're going to look bad. This, this is the way, this is the way the game is played. And if people want to, you know, I guess the more you know and and the more you get involved, maybe you play the game better. Some don't play it so well, but they are they are playing a careful game. And what they're doing, if you, if to be fair to them, is they're not completely ignoring. I guess you could say the alternative media on this. And alternative media is a very fuzzy phrase, and it covers so much territory. So let's give them some examples. All right. So. DeLong starts the ball rolling with his interview with George Knapp. Now, that's a good choice. George is into the subject, highly respected. He's not with a major entity. KLS-TV is, you know, it's a nice television station, but it's a local city station. But he's got a good rep. He's a good interviewer. Okay, nice place. And they do that, right? Um, Do they then start doing the whole circuit? No, they don't. Um, Eventually... Uh, as the thing breaks, they start getting out interviews, but they're picking their spots. In other words, you know, I get called for interviews sometimes, and then I say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that interview. I don't want to do that interview. It's not going to do me any good. So they're going to pick their spots. Now, when uh, Coast to Coast, admittedly, has got a very long track record. It didn't, it's been around for a long time, and it's got a fairly substantial audience. It's had a lot of people across the board. So nobody should be surprised that Coast is getting some attention here. So another another way they engage the alternative world is that uh, uh, Put Off does an interview on Coast to Coast. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was George Knapp again, right? So they're nibbling around the edges here. But I don't expect them. I don't expect these guys to be doing that circuit yet. I, they may eventually, but right now you can be sure they're trying to line up more interviews at the highest end, the higher end they yes. can get. Okay, but New I'll, York I'll, Times, I'll, I'll take this uh, to I'll take this to a different angle then. Okay? Because yeah. the rule of a journalist doesn't matter if you are working at a 50 watt radio station or you're working in downtown New York the rule of thumb is that you do not take any type of bribery or any type of work from outside investors because then your own credibility could be put on the line. And as a journalist, the rule of thumb is to stay neutral. Now, we sure. Had, well, what's your what's your uh, what's your what, what are you referring uh, to? That's my, that's interesting. Okay. So my point is here we have and and trust me when I say this, I am a big big fan. Of George Knapp. I have never met the guy. I've always been a fan. I have concerns that here we have a gentleman who is going to be paid off by Tom DeLong saying that he that he is going to be publishing Knapp's book on Bob Lazar. That's a little bit too tight for me. 
Leslie Kane, okay. say, same thing. Now, now, okay, I have a member of my team, Elizabeth Anglin, who is doing research for Ralph Blumenthal, who is an incredible researcher, who's, whose work is second to none. I mean, you don't get nominated for a Pulitzer Prize if you're a meathead or anything like that. This guy is brilliant. Run. I have no Run. issue with... Yes, who won? Pardon me. Okay, and well, he's nominated and he won. Yes, he has two. He, two. Absolutely. So we're, we're yeah. there are some smarts here, but but what I see from Blumenthal is he's not taking the bait. He is still staying as neutral as he possibly can, while others are going to get in the media are going to get paid off one way or another in this. To me, well, that's I, collusion. I, 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 look, I would. I would ask you to be as circumspect as possible on this. Now, you said because the word payoff is a loaded term. Now, if if in fact Tom DeLong has agreed to publish George Knapp's book, that is a that is a, that is a very legitimate point to raise. All right, um, and first of all, it needs to be disclosed, and if it's being disclosed, that's good. Right. Secondly, uh, well, George, George is a crossover guy. He doesn't have to do Coast to Coast AM. And Coast to Coast AM is not news. It's entertainment. It's an entertainment show. He doesn't have to do it. We know that he's a tough investigative journalist, and not everything he does with KLS TV, I am certain, is strong journalism. But... He's also chosen to do that show. I'm glad he did because George has brought a lot of credibility to this field. He's done some very important interviews. He's a very important part of this. So when he's interviewing DeLong on Coast to Coast, that's not quite the same thing as him doing an investigative piece on DeLong for KLS TV. And so you're getting into some, you're getting some blurry lines here. And all I can say is that as long as it's fully publicized, uh, and KLS TV is not having a problem, and it, they don't seem to find him being biased in any way with respect to any investigation he might be doing related to that. Well, that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, and, and again, as I pointed out, the the last days of the truth embargo are going to be incredibly intense and wild, and a lot of stuff going on, and everybody making moves. And I'm sure it's going to get confusing, and there's going to be some conflicts of sorts, and I invite, I invite people to be generous because this is a big, big, big deal. Now, to get back, though, to the most to the central point, and that is this. Um, the way it works is media comes to, uh, our journalists will come to organizations, entities, and what have you, looking for information because they've got stories they want to do. Fine. If you cooperate with them, they're grateful, and they may be, willing to return that favor if you have something for them. But ultimately, whatever goes out in the paper or on the web is supposed to be something that is ethical and has been screened or cleared by the publicist, I'm the publisher, or by the editor and what have you. In other words, not junk, right? And not, not strictly self-serving. But this symbiotic relationship is absolutely incredible. If, if, if all of the organizations and entities in the country and the media were all in an adversarial relationship, uh, that would be a problem. Now, the adversarial relationship that we do want is between the media and the government. But even then, they, they need the government to, to be cooperative and provide information so they can do proper stories. And in return, the politicians and the government goes to them. And so if you're a committee in Congress and you, you've got a hearing coming up and you think it's important, you'll contact one of your contacts at the Washington Post and say, you know, you want to do a story on that. And if they think it's legitimate news, they will. This is normal. This goes on all the time. It's not a big deal. But, you know, it's a big world. There's a lot happening. And so is only, you know, everybody doesn't get to play at the same time and so forth. I mean, perfect example. Uh, you know, and I'm not bitter. <laughs> I swear to God, I'm not bitter. Uh, in the middle of the 2016, well, in the middle of 2016, in May, when the articles had already been just huge numbers of articles, uh, many of which were referring to me, I think I had 130 articles in, you know, papers all over the place, including the New York Times, Washington Times, Washington Post, and so forth, talking about 
my work and what I was doing and, and the, you know, the, the Clinton and, you know, connection and all of that. All right, fine. I'm glad to have it. But the, I think probably the most significant article was, was the New York Times. I get a call from Amy Chozik, who's one of the top political reporters, and she says, you know, I'm reading all these things about Clinton and the things she's saying, and I think I'm going to do an article. Can I interview you? And I was very lucky. I happened to be in New York when I got the call on myself. And I said, I'll, I'll take a cab. I'll take an Uber down to the New York Times. You interview me right there. So I take an Uber down to the New York Times, and I interview with her for 40 minutes. And the next day, or the day or that later, she does an extensive article. Uh, it's May the 10th, I think. It's on my website, easy to find, about the Clinton ET connection. And I'm all over that friggin' article. Now, normally, right, in a fair and just world, when an article turns up about the leading presidential candidate and her connection to something as controversial as the ET issue, and one of the principal people driving that issue in the campaign is mentioned in the article by name, I should have been getting calls from every friggin' television network. There was. Not a single call. Nothing. Why? Because, as you know, the relationship between the media and the ET subject is a mess. As you say, it's not right. But the reason it's not right is the government spent decades making it not right. They have screwed the whole thing up. And the media has got a lot of catching up to do. But nevertheless, that's the media. That's the, the, these are the big dogs on the porch. And so uh, if they, it's a major story, I want it in the New York Times. And if there's a major interview, I want it the highest level possible. I would love to be doing those shows all the time, but I'm not getting, getting called. Maybe one day I will. And that's just the way that it is. And, I, uh, and all I can say is this. I invite everybody in this field, whether they're a journalist, whether they're a researcher, or an activist, is like, try to chill, talk about it, be positive, unless you utterly can't be positive, be supportive of what's going on, and I believe that it will all come around, right? Because we do have something the mainstream media, the high end, the top people don't have. We have far more knowledge about the history of this phenomena than any of the reporters at the Washington Post or the New York Times, right? You or I probably know more about this subject than the entire staff of, the Washington, of some of those papers. So there is the knowledge here. And ultimately, they're going to have to come here for that knowledge. And uh, I just invite people to hang in, do their best, and uh, cover it. Uh, and, and hopefully that will, that will come around. And I do believe ultimately that it will. Again, I'm getting calls from major you know, documentary people who are suddenly thinking they need to talk to me. Uh, fine. You know, a long time coming, believe me. A long time coming. But you were talking to a guy whose whole the – the principal reason that anybody cares about what I have to say is I wisely understood the power of Internet radio a long time ago. Uh, even when it was like broadcast.com was doing their thing and was coming on, I'm going, oh, man, this is the future. And the reason that I knew it was important wasn't because some of these shows were going to have audiences of five, six million or anything like that. No, not at all. And I, I, was, I was doing, unless a show is a real problem for me, I was doing any show that would ask me. I would do them on zero notice. I'd get a call at 5, 5 p.m. saying, can you do a show at 7? No problem. And when people know that, they call you back. And that's why I've got more interviews in the can on this subject than anybody in the world, now or ever. But the reason that I did it was because the Internet is a new ball game. And even, you know, the big shots like New York Times took them years before they started to catch up. And they're still trying to catch up. But the power of Internet radio is the archiving. Prior to the Internet, you get some great article in some good paper, right? And the papers are thrown away the next day, and the article ends up in a microfiche in a library somewhere. All right? That's it. But now, you know, you give a thousand... Uh, interviews on internet radio and half of them, maybe three quarters of them are archived. They're on the web. They're there forever, maybe. And then their links, they get picked up by the Google search bots. And next thing you're turning up on links, that's power, but it takes time for it to sort of have its impact. Uh, whereas, you know, one major piece in the New York times and bada bing. 
So Leslie Kane was the writer on that. Now, she's written articles before. She's earned the right to write that article in New York Times. But sure, she got interviewed by significant media almost immediately. That's understandable. I hope I get my shot, too. But I'll never forget the shows like Spaced Out Radio, and I could list them all. You know what I'm talking about. I'm never going to forget them. And I promise you, <laughs> if, I, if I get my 15 minutes of fame and suddenly everybody wants Steve, I'm not going to forget to come back and I'll be doing all these shows. Never going to not do these shows because they have been the rock, the sort of the bedrock that has kept this thing going so that one day this would all happen and the big shots would come in and you know, CNN and all that stuff and say, oh, my God, there's ETs here and all that crap. But, you know, history will not forget us. You know why? Because of the Internet. Uh, everything you've done, you know how many of your shows are archived, Dave? You know how much of what you've yes. done in the field is out there in, 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 the, in cyberspace? Same with me. This is, this is a great time to be a citizen journalist, citizen activist, citizen researcher. The net does not forget. So that's about the best way I can answer your question uh, on that. And are, I, you, you know, are, you involved, uh, I, are you involved with Tom DeLong? No. I've, I've sent some queries here and there, but I ain't getting any responses. <laughs> Do you not? Find, you know, I, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm on the bench, and I'm saying to the I'm, – I'm waving at the quarterback on the field going – can I get in for a play? <laughs> you know, he's he's got a team. He's marching up and down the field. He doesn't need me. Well, uh, and I understand. here's here's my concern with that though is when I look at the media or when I look at Tom DeLonge's group and I realize he's playing with some very high A-listers. He has got OJ's dream team of lawyers in this disclosure project. I think we can agree on that. But I do have a concern. Okay, you're not involved. Grant Cameron's not involved. Stephen Bassett's not. I mean, pardon me. Stephen Greer's not involved. Uh, Richard Dolan's not involved. That entire crew that has been doing this for 25, 30, 40 years has not mm. been asked at all to join this group. These are the people who have created their entire life and reputations on their respect for the field of ufology, and they've been pushed to the side. You have been cast aside by this, Steve. Uh, not cast aside, Dave. What we, we haven't been pushed aside. We are just not on that track. Now, it's like, have you ever, ever been to a, you know, every, I, 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 I was in, in England, of course, we're doing, you, you take the subway everywhere, and I love it, and you got trains everywhere. You're, you know, you've been at a station, and you think your train's coming, and you're all set, you get your luggage up there, and then it comes through, and you're, oops, that's, that's not the track, it's on the other track. It's like the track over. Uh, they have a track going there that has been developed. Uh, it's, it's about insiders getting involved in a public way, but in a way that's legitimate, legal, not violating any, 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 any security oaths and so forth, to advance this issue. The power of what he's doing is directly related to the power of that group, right? And, you know, I got to tell you, I, I didn't have a 30-year career at NASA or the CIA or the DOD. In fact, my years from 20 to 50 were completely pretty much wasted. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Oh, I, I was, I know I'm, if I had kept it together as a young man, I might've gotten a PhD in physics. I have a BS, might've been a work for NASA, but it didn't happen. These are, these are high level people, very sharp, very sophisticated and with substantial careers. I am not one of those people. I don't expect to be on that team. It's like the days in the lunchroom, man. I'm in high school. You remember you go in a lunchroom to have a little food and, you know, there's some tables there. And, you know, there are some tables you're not at that table. Right? I, I get that. Go but, to but here you are with all of your reputation and the standard that you have that you have created for yourself, which I think is pretty damn respectable, Steve. And you're, you just made a comment saying that you're, wait, you're sitting on the bench waiting to be tapped to get onto the field. And that tapping well, likely is not going to happen. Uh, look. Again, when I say I'm waving, to, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean you don't maybe just put out a flag or something, right? I'm not, I'm not going to go hide, right? Because you never know. I mean, this is a very complex process. Um, but the fact is, is while I was on the bench, I was uh, making my own plans, and those are unfolding right now. 
And so I'm going to, very quickly, you're going to see my presence elevated. You're going to see me doing some things which I think are useful and important. Again, a different track, right? Now, I, I would not be surprised if at some point down the line you're going to see some interaction develop between what's happening with that group and, um, and, and, and people like myself and Grant and, and Richard. Now, Richard did an interview. He got an interview, I think, on this. So did Grant. Right, I'm the one to give an interview, <laughs> but I was to be fair. I was in London. I didn't know this was going to happen. If I had known that that Delong was going to make his move on October the 11th, I would have gotten back to the U.S. sooner. But that's okay. Uh, that's all right. I, I needed to do what I needed to do here. But it will happen when it happens, and so I again, my I view my job right now because if you want to, you're only as good as what you did last week. In other words, if you want to be involved in something that's ongoing, you really have to work at it. You've got to keep putting things out there. You've got to put a lot of time into it. Uh, you don't. You never rest on your laurels, particularly when it comes to activism and, and historical type stuff. Um, and so my plan is simple. Uh, come up with new ideas and projects that could be useful and be very supportive of Tom DeLong and those people. Uh, until I, unless I have some very good reason not to be, which is not the case at this point, and hope that things will you know, be okay. You know, um, I, you know, I'm not Pal Pitoff. I, I'm not a genius scientist who's been involved in complex programs going back 50 years. I mean, th- you know, I, I recognize my place. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying that and, and so some of the alternative journalists and some of the people that are doing these, these shows, like yours, and let's face it, you're not, you know, you're not, uh, you're not, you're not, you're not uh, George Stephanopoulos, uh, top guy, news, one of the head, head of the news guys at NBC, making almost, and he's making $15 million a year. But, you know, now he's failed us. I know, I've criticized George extensively. He has really failed us on this. And a lot of these high-paid uh, news particular hosts, are not doing what they need to be doing. So I'm not afraid to criticize them. But then, you know, I wasn't a key advisor to, uh, to a president. I didn't have that kind of career. And so I, I think understanding these, these strata and also understanding that, we're, that there's multiple tracks underway is important if people want to keep their head, right? This is going to be a classic cape of keeping your head while everybody else is losing theirs. Right. And you end up, you know, coming out OK, because it's going to get pretty wild and crazy, Dave. I'm, I'm telling you, it, there's a lot of tension in this field, a lot of frustration. It's going to come out and people are going to get upset. Uh, there's going to be a, a lot of emotions and I understand it. Uh, I'm just going to try to keep my head on me you know, and keep my head about me and and uh, and do the best that I can. Right. Uh that's the best advice I can give. Uh, uh, it's, you know, I don't know what else to say, but I don't think these are bad people, and I'm, I don't think they're going to completely ignore us. I think that we, we will see some interactions. But right now, they're in the crucial, crucial early phase of this strategy, and it's working pretty well for them. Huge media coverage, New York Times top story, uh, gun camera footage out, and there's people in the Pentagon that didn't want that. So, I mean, this is not like a sleigh ride. The Pentagon has been approached three or four times by some journalists, and they've, they've, they denied even releasing the damn footage, which, you know, is probably not true, but they're kind of in a tough spot. So not everybody in the Pentagon and the CIA and elsewhere in government are necessarily on board with what these guys are doing, but they don't have enough influence, apparently, to stop it. So this is, this is a very tricky, very difficult, complicated process underway. History's being made, and, and I think we all just got to chill, be cool. And uh, I think those that are honest and, and sincere about what they've been doing, they're going to be recognized one way or the other. I am very preachy tonight, aren't I? Well, you know, 
I'll be honest with you. I I didn't expect a lot of these answers from you tonight, Steve. And I'm I'm a little Good. confused. I am a little confused because I expected you more to be on the side of what Grant has been on, which is you know there's a lot of holes. There's a lot of questions. This is very contrived. This is very set up, and that's that's kind of the angle that I see on this. You know, never mind the New York Times article. It was beautiful. It was brilliant. As if I take my radio show microphone hat off and away and take my journalist hat off, okay, as an experiencer, as someone who has been taken, someone who has seen a landing 150 yards away from me in the middle of sure. the night, I thought it was brilliant. Finally, people like me were able to get that vindication to say, I told you so. It's right here. Look in the Washington Post. Look in the New York Times. It's right here. Sure. I'm not crazy. But on the flip side, the way it has been handled from going back to 2007 to watching Robert Bigelow buy up everybody's UFO websites that he can, as many as he can, to now finding out that originally he wasn't tied to To the Stars, but now he apparently is, there is this whole rigmarole that is going on and it's happening so fast that maybe I'm just way too Canadian and say, want to say, hey, let's just take a step back here and breathe a second before we try and put these puzzle pieces together. And I agree with you that it's very confusing, but there has to be something, Steve, to be said with the way that they are controlling this entire process. That's what governments do. And if To The Stars is not a government program, why are they acting like that? Because they are not answering very many questions unless it's to the, their own people whom they've cut deals with. I, um, I again, I don't. I don't, I don't, I would not use that kind of language. Um, there, first of all, one of the, the first, uh, there was no way, what everybody wants is a, a complete dump of the whole damn thing, and, and then we just go through it and learn it, and that's fine, but that's not, not, not going to happen that way. Even if the government announced the ET presence tomorrow, I mean, the president, uh, th it's going to take a good while before you know, the tens of thousands of dots start to get connected. Um, but these guys, they, they have, they, here's, here's the thing. They're, they're, they're at, the people that were inside had to step back because they could, not, they could not risk under the current situation to be directly involved. So a couple of them retired, came right on board. Others were already outside government. But they, they still have non-security oaths. They're all under non-security oaths of one type or another. So the first problem they had was that uh, in order to not upset people inside and create a, a big pushback, they had to be very limited in what they say. I assure you that whatever they're saying, they know a hell of a lot more than that. But they are avoiding strenuously not violating a non-security oath. So that's one reason why you're not just getting a much broader dump and this and that. The other reason is, is that in order for disclosure to finally happen, the media has got to get heated up to a certain level. We've got to have the media keep the pressure on so that some sort of reproach mock can be made between the Pentagon and the White House. Uh, and the way you do that is you just don't suddenly walk in and give them everything you have and then walk away. You've got to, you've got to be structured about it. You've got to plan it out. Uh, so the orchestration may seem phony to people, but in fact, it's absolutely necessary. Right? And then it, given the nature of media and the nature of of, uh, of journalism and, 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 and the public's attitudes about journalism and so forth. This is a tough time to break big stories. This whole fake news meme that's going on, it's just nonsense. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's simple-minded. It, it's meaningless. It doesn't add anything to it. And it's being pushed by people that are, in many cases, you know, the, the professionals of fake news. But whatever. Right. I, again, I, most people don't have the time to study journalism as much as I have, so I understand that. But this is not – I mean, I, I believe that – look, something this big should be scrutinized. It should be watched. And if there's anything there that seems a little bit funny, it should be brought up. No problem. Right. Uh, and I'm not going to tell somebody not to do that, but rather 
uh, we are in the early stages of what seems to be a very, very uh, complex strategic process. And, you know, it's going to play out at a certain pace. And there's nothing we can do about that. They're the ones that are calling the shots on their end. But again, keep in mind, if the media wanted to, they could tell them all to go fly a kite. And in the past, they have. But they're not doing that now. And, 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 and one of the reasons is citizen science researcher activists like you, like me, like so many of the people I know, colleagues, you know who we're talking about, have been pushing this for a very long time. We have worn the media down. We have, we have established a platform. It wasn't easy, and, and it, but it would have been, you know, a lot easier if the government didn't put hundreds of millions of dollars into making it hard. I mean, there are people that wanted the, the, the truth and uh, the, the, the embargo of Cuba ended decades ago. The government simply wouldn't do it. And so they pushed and pushed and pushed, and it didn't happen. But they kept pushing, and they kept laying some groundwork there. And ultimately, we've gotten some breakthroughs on that. You know, it, it's, it's not easy being an activist. It's not easy challenging the state. Uh, it's, it's a tough road. Uh, and in one way or another, when it comes to the ET issue, we are all challenging the U.S. US government and a 70-year history. I want it to end in our lifetime. I, there's a lot more vindication coming, Dave, believe me. Uh, if you're a contactee, then you, you've got an even more emotional investment in seeing this resolved, uh, and I'm totally with you on that. Um, there's more coming. Keep, keep scrutinizing it and raise the points. But I, I, I tell you, I've, I got a good feeling about this. So, I, I, and I hope yeah. so too, I, Steve. I don't want to. I don't want to sound like a jerk on this, okay? But I, I want to see this succeed too. I want those answers out there. Many of my friends who are experiencers want that answer out there, and I sure. agree that it needs to come out. However, I I am still vehemently opposed to the way they're doing it because it does not seem fair. It does not, it, it Again, seems contrived. Think fair, think effective. You know, don't think about fairness, think effective, right? Is it effective? Fair is, is a very uh, mushy term. What's fair, right? I, I mean, get, the Boston Globe that. didn't get that story. I mean, that Boston Globe could be pissed, you know, why didn't you come to us? Well, you don't take a story like that to 10 papers. You take it to one. So it's about, are they effective? And it seems pretty effective to me. Okay. Uh, so is, in, is, in, is Tom DeLong going to have a misstep or two? He might. He might make a couple of missteps. He's not, you know, some genius, and and he's uh, basically a musician. But I'm hoping, you know, I, well, hopefully, we'll be generous and understanding if he does make a few missteps. We got about four minutes with you, and I got two questions left that I that I want to get in here before I have to let you go. Fire uh, away. Number one, was Tom DeLong shut up on a? or quieted down, let me use a more polite term, uh, quieted down because of the way he was speaking at the Joe Rogan Experience interview, where in one sense he's saying, I can't tell you, which is a good thing, but on the other thing, on the other side, he's telling people that he should just whip his dick out in the middle of the interview. Uh, well, you know, going on an interview with Joe is a, uh, uh, how would you say, a, not sure of the word, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a wild ride. I, uh, it, it, I look, Tom is in a tough spot. He, he, he wants, he wants this out. He wants uh, all this to kind of work out, but he is working with high level people who got credentials up the yin yang. He does not have them, but he's kind of the front guy. He's an autodidact. I don't, he didn't even finish high school, I don't think. Or I think he got a GED later on. He's an autodidact. He's taught himself. So he's rough around the edges. So he's not slick like they am, and, and he doesn't have those kind of uh, credentials. And But he's still the one people want to talk to. And so, but the trade-off there, and they, I think they understand this, is that the new gen, the millennial generation and the younger Gen Xs, they don't, they don't care about that so much. He can relate to them. And these, you know, it's the millennials that are going to have to live in the post-disclosure world long after you and I are gone. And so he can reach out to them. And so that is part of the reason why this is the way it's played out. Uh, I get that. Smart move, actually. Um, but Tom is, is going to be tougher for Tom 
to avoid getting into some boa corners or something in his interview interviews you might do. Right. And if it goes bad, I'm sure the guys inside are going to say, Tom, you know, that's probably not a good idea. Let's be careful here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not saying he's on a leash, but they're clearly working together. And so there's going to be some of that. Right. You, you probably won't see, you know, but, and so he, 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 he goes on Joe's show. So Tom is in a position to do any show and he's done a lot of them. Yes. So he is for, for these guys, he's the interface to the alternative world, the world that you and I, the, the ET world that, 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 that we're part of. He's the interface. Okay, fine. But he does that job while they, they're back there in the back planning out whatever they're doing, right? These guys have all got reputations. They've all got legacies. And they know they're putting these reputations at risk. Uh, and now, you know, they've got good lives. They probably right. make good money. I'm not sorry for them. But when you spend your whole life building up a career, a reputation in, in the Pentagon or NASA or the CIA or anything else, mm-hmm. the idea, you know, you've got kids, what have you, the idea that it could all get trashed. Mm-hmm. is not a fun thing to imagine. And so, so they have that concern as well. Steve, I, I, in 60 seconds or less, is the government funding uh-huh. is the government funding to the stars behind no. the scenes? No. no. No, they'd be crazy to do that. No way. He's, he, he, they don't need to. He's, he's going to be able to fund himself using the public service thing. Uh, you know, these guys, you know, these guys... They, they, all those guys on that team, they, they, could, they, they have a lot of op- options, uh, lucrative contracts, deals, consultancies. They could be making tons of money. And so they have committed to Tom. So the, the idea that they're going to do this voluntarily you know, for nothing, no. So he's raised the money so these people can be paid. That's good, but still not huge amounts. But no, if the government is funding Tom DeLong, that would be a colossal mistake. And I have no indication, see no indication that that is the case. My friend, once again, it's going to be an absolute pleasure to uh, share a drink with you down in San Francisco, March 23rd to 25th. Please tell my listeners quickly here where they can find your website. ParadigmResearchGroup.org. Got a graphic problem. It'll be fixed by tomorrow night, hopefully. It's a brand new site. I just did it on the WordPress master now. Val before me. (laughs) <laughs> right on right on and i apologize right. about the background music coming in there but uh once once again my friend it's going to be an absolute pleasure to once again get an opportunity to shake your hand say hello have a beer and share some ufo stories look forward to it thank you so much for being on spaced out radio tonight steve all the best to you thank you sir bye-bye coming up in hour number three Rich Giordano from the Paranormal Code is going to join us. We're going to continue UFO talk. We're even going to open up the phone lines to you. 250, sorry about that, 702-302-4556. Rich Giordano, next on SOR. Hello, SOR listeners. Lorian Fenton here. Let me ask you, now that disclosure's happened, what does it mean for ufology? For answers, join us at UFOCon 2018 in South San Francisco, California, March 23rd through 25th. Keynote speakers Stephen Bassett, Grant Cameron, and Melinda Leslie address the current disclosure agenda. Dave Scott, yes, you're Dave Scott, and Lynn Buchanan tell of amazing alien encounters. Get your tickets at caufocon.com. That's caufocon.com. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. The first annual Caribou Paracon is happening September 28th to 30th in the 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Brought to you by the Canadian Society of Questers and Spaced Out Radio. Come listen to our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Elizabeth Anglin, Paisley Town, Mike Morin, Eric Cooper, and more. It's a three-day supernatural adventure at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Tickets for the weekend are $150 Canadian. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an escape watch? 
Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. We're lighting the void on Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, this is Joe Root, and I'm hanging out in SOR headquarters every Saturday night, bringing you the latest news when it comes to the weird and strange. Bigfoot, occult, UFOs, ghosts, and everything in between, I got you covered. You can tune in to spacedoutradio.com starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. Come travel into the void with us on Spaced Out Saturdays. Got ready for bed on Saturday night? Right after Spaced Out Saturdays, hop on over to S4 with Corey Ruiz and me, Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. With S4, there are no limits to what we try and uncover. From government conspiracies to help you clean up the paranormal, no topic is safe on S4. We get to the heart of the matter, of the subjects you want to learn more about. So tune in on S4 starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with U4 Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Witkowski's Strange Days. This is Eric Markham, news editor for the Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories, from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter Online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know the truth? Do UFOs exist? Are aliens real? Are the governments hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO seekers, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow along with us as we journey across the United States, visiting UFO hotspots and alien hotspots, trying to document the UFO phenomenon. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. It's Cosmic Sundays with me, Elizabeth Anglin, in Cosmic Passport. Let me take you down a three-hour spiritual journey where we will get into everything from ET contact to Psychic Sundays. It's a journey of listening and learning together with some of the best professionals in their fields. You can tune in to Cosmic Passport at spacedoutradio.com every Sunday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, 
Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. A child grew up too fast, we're running wild, now we don't know Welcome back to the third and final hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, our Keith Andrews is back. Yes, I know the Twitter crowd is very excited at hashtag Space Out Radio about that. And I know you are too in all the chat rooms and out there. Keith will be here for his monthly appearance on the ET Connection. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in noon in Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans, and over 160 countries around the world. We are also live. Live on The Fringe FM. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com or revolution.radio and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Flavicomus. Flavicomus is your password. Nobody knows what it really means, but Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio if you want to connect live with me during the show as well. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, follow me at Dave Scott. S-O-R. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. We are also live every night now, Monday through Friday, on periscope.tv. And make sure you subscribe to us there as well. We would appreciate it. We're on iHeartRadio in the United States. Talk stream live. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download and subscribe to our shows on iTunes, our website, is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month, rock out to some Bumblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, read up on the Encounter Online, or you can also watch great videos from UFO Seekers, Contact TV, and so much more at spacedoutradio.com. Now, we're still efforting to get a hold of Rich Giordano, he was in the chat room earlier. Maybe he had a little bit of a computer breakdown. Not too sure. But we are opening up the phone lines this hour until we get to the thought of the Dave, which happens later on in the program. Steve Bassett, what did you think? What did you think? Were you on his terms, saying that we really need to take a good look at this? Were you on his terms that we should give to the stars a an opportunity to see what they can do? Or do you still have questions? This is my big concern. You know, there are a lot of us out here who have had experiences who have seen UFOs come in contact with them, had close encounters of the third kind who have had abduction experiences, who have had contact experiences with extraterrestrials. Yet there's a lot of people out there who are separating the two, that UFOs has nothing to do with alien contact. I tend to disagree with that theory, but maybe I'm being a little naive on it. So I want to hear from you guys. Do you believe that... Tom DeLonge is doing a great job. Do you believe that he was actually the mastermind behind all of this? Do you believe, if you are an experiencer, that this is a good thing? And I will go on record once again saying that New York Times article written by Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Kane and Helen, I forget her last name, was a great article for those of us who have had close encounter type experiences. It was a victory day for us. 
We finally won, us experiencers. We finally won. But now when you start to analyze everything, to see how everything has played out, how everything has been set up, are you still comfortable with that? Are you comfortable to learn that Robert Bigelow has his hands deeply tied into this project? Are you comfortable with the fact, if, especially if you're American, that even though your government may not be funding this, that the information is obviously coming from them? Apparently, flavicomas means having yellow hair. Thank you, Goddess Michelle. Appreciate that. Still got to figure out how to put that in a sentence. But nonetheless, I'm opening up the lines to you. one 702 302 4556 I want you to call in. I want you to call in and tell me, if you are an experiencer, is this a good move? Do you think Steve Bassett is a little bit more involved than what we know or what he's giving up? Don't forget, he is a lobbyist. I don't think he is. I think he's someone, after this many years, we could take his word for it. But even though Steve and I disagree on a lot of this, on the entire process that has gone through, I respect his excitement. Steve has worked for nearly 30 years on this. 30 years. He doesn't care who gets the message out. Did he want to be the guy? Of course he wanted to be the guy. Stephen Greer wanted to be the guy. Stanton Friedman wanted to be the guy. Richard Dolan wanted to be the guy. Don, I know uh, I know you're in a Canadian market, okay? I know my number's American. If you hit me up on Facebook with a private message or on Twitter with a private message, I will call you. You drop me your phone number. I will call you to get your opinion on that. How about that? Come on, Joe Monk. You know you want to call in. You know you want to call in. You always have an opinion. And yes, Dave does need a kokanee, but... Really, Dave needs a a good burger right now, and all the burger joints around here are closed. And I'm kind of working. Anyways, back to Steve Bassett here for a second. I think his heart is in the right place. I really, really do believe that. I think he is genuinely excited for this news to get out. I think he is genuinely, genuinely happy that finally years upon years upon years of slaving over this. You got to realize something about Steve Bassett, and this is why I respect him. Okay, I respect him because he put his entire financial life on hold, on hold to lobby for everybody who has had a UFO sighting for the U.S. government to come clean on it. Right? Everybody that he has worked with and for on this, lobbying government officials, from Congress members to retired Congress members to senators, everybody that he has done a voice for, he put his life on hold for this. As you heard him say, he's 71 years old, and he, he's a vagabond. He's a vagabond because he decided that this cause was more important than money. So he doesn't have his own home. He's a vagabond. And I can respect that. I can respect the fact that he, you know, whether you agree with his comments or not... And I will go on record to say I'm not a a fan of it. 
I'm not a fan of the process. Although, I do believe as an experiencer it's great. All right. But I love his excitement. Okay, I think he is fantastic. I do. I think his heart is in the right place because he wants to see this story go, get out. He wants to see this happen. One seven zero two three zero two four five five six. If you want to call on in to Spaced Out Radio, are you in agreement with Stephen that this is a good? This is good. Everything is good. Doesn't matter how it comes out as long as it comes out. Or do you have? like many in the alternative field do, have reservations about this topic. I'm very surprised that Stephen and Grant, being close, that their opinions are 180 from each other, 180 degrees from each other. I mean, we heard two very powerful men this week in a span of three days in a span of three days, we heard two very powerful men in this topic give two completely different sides of the story. Where do you stand on it? I want to know. If you're an experiencer... Tell me what you think. We're going to go to the phone lines right now. Area code 423, calling on in. Who am I speaking with? Hey, good evening, uh, Dave. This is Tommy. How hey, you doing? Good, Tommy. How you doing, man? Oh, well, I was uh, enjoying your conversation over there, uh, really. Uh, it's it's uh, always on my mind. Yes, mine too. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Do I have a minute? You got another yeah. caller? Or, no, you uh, go right ahead. Um, this, this is you and me, my friend. You and me. Uh, most times you got to make it quick, and there's uh, you, you just not nobody's going to get any any resolve if you're trying to find fast answers on uh, something that's just off the charts. You know. Uh, I heard Grant. I've heard him before. Uh, Steve before, and, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, and I don't ever would put anybody down. Uh, you know, you can have your own viewpoint and, uh, everybody's, you know, I respect, uh, and honor the work in people's, uh, serious viewpoints. Um, it's a dualistic thing. There's many things going on. Multi-dimensional means many, many, many. Uh, it's everybody's right. And that's how bizarre it is. It's everybody's right. And uh, we can always find fault. Somebody's wrong. But uh, uh, Grant, for example, thinks the president knows what's going on. I don't. Uh, he, he's got too many things to do. <laughs> He's not playing around with little green men. Uh, he probably knows about it, but, you know, it's not a need to know. Um, this whole, this whole out, uh, breaking out in uh, December yeah. was, uh, you know, marvelous. Uh, it's, it's only, the, you know, the fuse has been lit, that's all. And what people might think, to be a long process, I don't. I think this is once you light that fuse, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to go. And they're just waiting. Uh, it's mm -hmm. all orchestrated. All orchestrated. Nothing by mistake. Bob Bigelow on down the line. This is all to take the load off the fiction government that cannot expose itself. And it has to do it slow. And the only reason it's doing it now is because there is a good alliance that is, that is, that is, is working on this against the bad alliance, the Dracos, running the planet for millennia, uh, and okay. this whole and this whole reason that this is happening now in our lifetimes because 
we elected to to be here at this time without the conscious memory of it. No re no no mistakes. Um, let me ask you a question. It, it, let me let me ask you a question. Are are you an experiencer? No, don't want to be. No, okay. I mean I could. I mean I'm, I I have like uh, let's see. I uh, got it out of my mind about uh, fifteen years ago. I bought a, a, a Sony video cam with a, a, a third gen night scope, and I got about twenty or thirty uh, unidentified uh, UAVs on video, and I put it to bed. I I, I saw enough. I you know hey, <laughs> I don't need to see one in my front yard. I know. <laughs> We're not alone, and no, uh, so it's about a lot. Of, it's a lot of controversy that people uh, distract themselves on. When, when my point I was getting to was the, the larger down the road event, maybe short time. I'm thinking five or so, six, uh, seven years is an ascension event, and nobody's talking about it. It's a prep prep job, acclimate uh, acclimation to raise the consciousness of people to behave in a manner that 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 we can get along and pass our and have peace on earth and pass our differences to be one and recognize this I hope and so. what i think, and what i think uh you know people aren't going to get an opportunity to vote for this change they don't they don't want they they think they want disclosure but when it comes down to it it's a good thing but they're not going to like what they're going to see right because uh, while uh, you got disclosure of the alien or, uh, presence, uh, uh, it's really about the disclosure and exposure of the people who have participated and caused the very, and been a part of the very problem they're complaining about. So you can't change the world with the same crummy thinking that created the old world we're all complaining about. And this right. is a problem because the hardest thing in the world to do is to have to face yourself and everybody has a lifelong preoccupation right. in everything but that. And this I is appreciate the disclosure. That. This is the disclosure. And uh uh the the uh you know um to me the 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 high the, the benevolent uh ETs, human humanoid uh they're not going to mess around with there. There's a prime directive of non-interference in a developing civilization, and they're not playing with us. They're not telling us anything. We got to figure it out on our own. Nobody's going to save us. The negative, partially positive ones, and the negative ones. It's a mix. Are the ones playing with us along with the government? And and I heard Stephen Greer say on Jimmy Church's show last night or the other night. I think it was last night that. Uh, he has talked to, and he knows, um, abduction, um, uh, people on an abduction squads 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, it's all bizarre, and you're gonna, not going to try to figure it all out. You can't know so, everything. So let, let me ask you this, uh, and I do have another caller coming in that is waiting here, but I want to ask you one more question. If this is so good, and you just talked about abduction squads... There are many people out there who believe John Alexander, who was our guest two weeks ago, three weeks ago tonight, was part of those abduction squads along with Robert Bigelow. And guess who they're tied to? If you want to go down that road, I'm just and I'm and I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm just telling you that this is one of those questions where, like I said, I think the disclosure movement. I don't agree with Grant that says this is confirmation. I, I believe that this is what I call a soft disclosure. But who is running it, and why is it running this way? And when you see the players, and then you hear, like last night with John Tenney, where we started talking about the aviary, and the players in the aviary that include Hal Putoff, that include Chris Mellon, John Alexander, Robert Bigelow, and more, it does make you wonder... What is the sense of what is really going on behind the scenes? You might be absolutely right, 
what's going on to me is that this wouldn't have been ha- this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't uh, 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 mandated to happen. Uh, th- this is a positive timeline. This is not an Armageddon uh, uh, scenario here. It's not a planet a level uh, a planet uh, an extinction level planet scenario. This is an ascension level event. And right now, it's all negative because we have negative Dracos, Dracos, off-planet, under-the-planet, uh, infiltrated in every element of our life that is trying to be, uh, that no human so far or, or, or group of people have been able to get rid of these uh, very negative, unemotional, reptilian conting- contingent that has right. been running the planet for right. a long time, so it's happening, and what is going to get rid of them is an ascension event, and it is a preparation right. for it, and that is down the road, and we, the people of the earth are going to need time to make their choice as to they want to buy that ticket to the ascension train and raise their vibrational resonance frequency so they're right in on. a good mood. So they could meet that wave. Otherwise, these other people are going to get taken off in a couple different locations and get recycled or go live out their cycles of karma for another 26,000 years. But right. I don't want to reincarnate anymore. You know? I, I, got, I, I don't want to reincarnate anymore. Tommy, so, thank you so I, much. I, I, I unfortunately okay. have to cut you off because I do have someone else waiting in line thank here. You. But thank you so much for calling in. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dave. Take okay. care. Thank you for listening. One seven zero two three zero two four five five six is the phone number, or if you want to get me on Skype, all one word: spaced out radio, Dave. Before I get to the next caller, Gail is asking, "What? Alexander was a part of an abduction squad?" If you remember that in the interview we did with John Alexander, he said that you know at a conference in california there was a lady yelling at him saying you were there when i was taken you were there when i they were doing those horrible things to me lorian fenton knows about 14 or 15 people i may be off on that number by a couple either way who have reported seeing john alexander during their my lab or abduction experiences. How true that is, I don't know. I really don't. But if you notice, John Alexander's name keeps popping up. So it's very intriguing. Very intriguing. We do have another caller on Skype here. It's an unknown phone number. Who am I speaking with? Oh, this is Liz. Hi, it's Sister Liz. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. How are you? I am very good. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have to, I want to say something about that last part, you know, somebody seeing somebody in, during an abduction. Um, there may be people who are involved in my labs who don't know that they're involved in my labs, like, like, and they may appear to be in positions of authority or working with aliens and they may have no memory of it. Um, so, you know, if you were to go to John Alexander and say, well, you, we've got this person, this person, per- this person, they all, uh, you know, think they've seen you on a ship. And if he doesn't have any memory of it, he just doesn't have any memory of it. Um, and it, it happens pretty darn often that somebody will see somebody they think they recognize during an abduction experience. And it could be screen memories. It could be the, you know, like I had friends who saw Michael Jackson during abduction experiences. Um, I had an, a friend who saw, um, oh, what's the, the woman from um, Fleetwood Mac with the blonde hair during the, an abduction experience. The goat, um, yes. Yeah, the goat. <laughs> the way, she's not a goat, but yeah, that that well, one. Come on, somebody um, on somebody on Twitter has to pick that up. That snarky crew on uh, on Twitter has to pick that up. Come on, <laughs> South Park, Stevie Nicks, the goat. That is, yeah, that's Stevie. just absolutely funny to me. It's absolutely <laughs> funny to me. Well, <laughs> um, you know, and and there's also. Uh, 
so do you know who the guitar player is who's who's no. an abductee and the famous singer? Um, no. Cheryl Crow and Eric Clapton. Um, you, can, you can also put Robbie Robertson on that list as well. Robbie Robertson, I you know I guess <laughs> yeah. I don't know Robbie Robertson, but you know so there is there are and there are people I know that that have been caught up in rehabs, my labs are rehabs, and made to work or been compelled to work um, for for reabductions or my lab abductions because of certain skill sets that they have. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that uh, somebody's figured out they have something that they can do and the government is interested in it. So, you know, it, conspiracy, it, it's like you got to you gotta go, well, you know, John Anderson may be an abductee who, who doesn't remember stuff because certainly he thought the lady who saw him on a ship was was nutters um but that happens more often than most pe than people suspect it does that people remember seeing other people on ships especially if they show up in this community um so and and we kind of have to withhold judgment on whether somebody is a government operative or not a government operative, because, you know, Dave, you could be a government operative and not know you were. Well, the the stories that I have heard about John Alexander, and once again, these are stories, I'm hearing this third, fourth-hand information, so I'm not at all talking about truth here. By the way, Sammy Hagar and Billy Corgan, both both Sammy also, Hagar, yeah. Both <laughs> are very much involved, but... Um, now, where are I going? Oh, with John Alexander. Now, I'm don't quote me on this, okay? I'm just bring, relaying the information that I have heard from my sources because this rabbit hole gets ridiculous at times, and there are times where literally I don't know what to believe and what not. But I am passing this information on to you because one of the sources that gave it to me, I trust and apparently these numerous people who saw John Alexander on the ship with them, John was not there as an abductee. He was actually standing with the alien race, kind of observing what they are doing to the human beings or the MyLab people. Yeah, that, but that can, you know, that can appear to be that way many, many times. So we have somebody who's been on, been on with you, um, the, uh, Byron. Byron Lacey. Byron Lacey, yes. But Byron Lacey is an abductee. But when I first met Byron, he was working with the aliens to keep me from knocking them against a wall. Does that mean Byron's bad? No. It means that they got scared enough of me that they got a big, tall guy to keep me from knocking them against the wall, and he appeared to be working with the aliens. And there, there are going to be a lot of times when people think that somebody appears to be working with the aliens, and, and maybe, you know, in a certain way they are, but maybe, again, they aren't. So, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, and, yeah, okay, that could be, but I've also been in situation situations with people where it looks like certain people are working with the aliens, and they're really just at doing another thing that they have people who are a little bigger and stronger and and not able to get their heads broken when they get slammed against a wall do. So I don't know. You know, I'm not, I again, I'm not really willing to point any fingers and get into a whole, let's, let's call that person a, a bad or, you know, call them guilty of something of working with the aliens or whatever, because it can look like that and really not be about what the person would do if they're on their own recognizance. As someone who has been in a my lab experience, Liz, and I'm talking about you because I don't know if I have or not. I do not think that I have. Mm -hmm. 
what is the difference between a my lab experience and regular alien abduction? My labs get really twisted, and um, and I I'm more likely now to use the term rehab because I think my labs are reabductions, uh, and not. In my experience, what happened with me was the Zaytans would, what we think of the greys, the Zaytans, they would take me. A couple days later, I would be in a very earthly-looking place with reptilians and possibly military. Now, when I was a kid, a lot of the kids in my town, it seemed like there was something very my lab going on in the town because we had people during the time that I was abducted with a friend and the police were called because her father noticed it happening and noticed we were gone. There were, there were human people, human guys who said they were with the FBI, but they weren't who were at my parents' place within an hour and a half collecting all of my journals in order to see if I had written anything about what was going on so that they could take any evidence that I might have that might have come out of my brain away, and they they took all of my my journals. I'm 17, you know. That's like a complete violation of a 17 year old to take your journals away, and you have various and sundry people you don't know reading them. So, and the, there was a young man who was killed, but he was talking about his experiences, and from what I can glean from what I remember, the the experiences we had as kids were my lab's rehabs. You know, we were getting abducted and then getting re-abducted by the government. I and think I'm there's gonna cut, super I'm gonna soldier... Cu- I'm going to cut you off right there because I just want to make this comment. There is a town near me, and I believe you when you say that you think the whole town is under there, under this influence, because there is a town about an hour, hour and a bit from me, just southeast of me, that is said to have that same thing going on as well. That's the yeah. hi- hidden rumor. Yeah, I mean, there are just too many. There are too many people from my town that had things happening. Too many kids and around the same age. But the other thing is, there was a guy from my town who claimed that he had been taken for te- for his telekinetic abilities, and he told me this when I was nineteen that he was part of a super soldier program and they were using him to assassinate people with his mind. And the odd thing about it was he had a terrible relationship with his father. His father ended up dying in a farming accident that was incredibly strange, which, you know, it could have been that he pissed his son off and he he went telekinetic on him. And then he was accused of... um, in proper sexual conduct with his stepdaughter and the stepdaughter ended up having an accident in a really weird way. And it could have been a telekinetic thing, but this was in 1984 that he told me this 84, 85 and other people started coming out with the same thing. He was terrified. He had, he, you know, he had some telepathic ability, some telekinetic ability. He said that, you know, if you, if you go to Boston, the government will find you and they'll make you into one of their soldiers. But I think that was already happening in the town I was in. And I think I probably did good by getting out rather than staying in. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, cause he was in that town and, you know, it, it, back then he had a lot of information that has come out since and that other people are saying I have somebody who contacted me who was very, very good at remote viewing, and he said, I trained him, and now he was working with the government, and he was being trained to to basically go into places and kill aliens and then leave again. And they did a call. Liz, you hold on one sec, because Joe Roop has just come in. Joe, you got a question. I'm going to keep Liz on yep. here because I like Liz. Does anybody think that that uh, Bassett is Steve Bassett? And I think that uh, I respect a guy just like you said. 
But I mean, I'm not an abductee. I'm not an. I've never seen an alien. You know, I, I, I have the big I want to believe poster in here. You know, but it's a, still a part of me thinks wants to know how much money does this guy have invested in this thing. Oh, I don't think Steve Bassett has think any does. money. Steve doesn't no, have. He's not uh, had any money for a long time. Steve or to invest. Steve ha- went. He literally put every single dime and has been living off of donations from people who believe in his work for the last 15 years. His money ran out a long time ago. So for Steve to put in even the $200. To, That's two, I thought it was, is it 250 or 200? 200. Minimum oh, okay. 200. You know, I don't see him doing that whatsoever. I really don't see him when, you know, he's got other things that he could put his money on. Sure. Yeah, and the whole thing about the government funding is like I don't think it's got there's government money in there, but I, I still think just like he was saying is the truth embargo has pushed on him enough that that's that's all this is. It's just another form of can you know information control. Uh, I mean, so I actually, yeah, I don't think it is. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know much about Tom DeLong, but. You know, Ralph Blumenthal and I, before I even met Dave, had a conversation about what he would need to get a front page New York Times article. And he said he would need a letter from the government in some form Mm -hmm. admitting that they knew about UFOs. So, you know, (coughs) the conspiracy is a conspiracy of co-conspirators to get this information out. And I believe Steve, I'm with Steve Bassett on that. Liz, I want to ask you a question, okay? Because uh, I, we got about five minutes here before we got to do the thought of the day. And Joe, you can hang on too. You don't need to go anywhere, okay? But for a lot of people in this field, we we're hearing about Leslie Kane. We're hearing about George Knapp, okay? But we're talking about about a Pulitzer Prize winning author here who is is very well known, held in very high regard. Could you please tell our audience who Ralph Blumenthal is? Ralph Blumenthal is a New York Times ju- journalist. He's he's a he's I think he's got a Pulitzer or was nominated for a Pulitzer for journalism for the New York Times for investigative reporting. He also teaches at a Columbia University journalism. So, um he was contacted, the Mack family, John Mack's family, was looking for someone to do his biography. And they really wanted someone special who would do a fair and, and impartial reporting on his life and wouldn't turn it into a smear campaign. And who that abductees who would have to work with him to help him piece together the later part of his life, which was working with abductees, would feel comfortable with and would feel was trustworthy to do a fair reporting of what they were saying. And so I met Ralph over the phone in 2014, just before I published my book. And we had several through our conversations and now he's almost finished with the John Mack biography. So what what um what Lorian was saying about him not doing anything with experiencers is is completely wrong because he's been working with experiencers for years now and he's to my mind part of this co conspiracy that everybody who wants to bring this forward and have disclosure is working on it. And it doesn't really pay for us to point fingers and say, well, you're part of a government plot or you're part of a government plot. There might be a government plot, but most of us, to our knowledge, are not involved in it. And neither is Ralph. Ralph is a good guy. You don't think that it's a plot to control the information, though? No, because... He, there's I mean, a even, lot of even uh, Tom DeLonge himself a, said he knows that's what's going on. He knows so he's being a, used. There's always control of the information. Like, Ralph couldn't, okay. get, he couldn't get a story in the New York Times if he didn't get a letter from the Pentagon admitting something or having somebody there admitting something. And he knew that three years ago. He said, what it would take for me to get a front page is admission in writing from the from the government and he got to some extent that thing now yes he may be being used in the fact that they gave it at this time but the intent behind it is actually to finally get 
disclosure. Now, what we do with it, those of us who really want this, it's important to keep our focus on the goal and keep going for it because there might be all this sideways stuff that comes in whether or not we know it's coming in. And we don't want to create it or create things that make make the whole thing go sideways ourselves by being reactionary and fearful of people who have been in the in the business for a long time. Leslie Kane has been around for a long time. It doesn't mean she's part of a government conspiracy. She's actually done a lot of work to get good information out. There are other people. Steve has been around for a long time. He's given up everything he has. He's a good person. So, you know, we shouldn't start pointing fingers and saying, oh, it's only for special people or it's only for academics, or it's only for the elite. You know, if we have some of those people who are willing to put their necks on the line and go out on a limb, we should still go, thank you right. For, right. for doing that. Oh, I, I agree with you, Liz. I agree with you uh, on that. And I think there's some very exciting times that are going to be coming in the next few months regarding this. But at that note, it's time for the thought of the day. <laughs> Thought of the Dave happens every single day on Facebook. I'll put on my personal profile a question. And then I read your responses to those who take the time to respond. If my post falls into your Facebook algorithms. Today's question on the Thought of the Dave. If you are a UFO experiencer or abductee slash contactee, are you happy with disclosure right now? If so, why? So we're going to read some of the responses here from you, the listeners. Serena says, I am cautiously optimistic. I am happy that disclosures were made on December 16th because it brought the subject to the attention of the wider world with a noteworthy lack of giggle factor. But I am suspicious, too. Not everything is lining up for me. And I question whistleblowers because blind allegiance to a story is not serving higher purpose. It's not about believe or don't believe. It's about using internal discernment to determine resonance. It also about following the stories without judgment and seeing if they are validated or not. Liz, what do you think of that? I think that's a really, I think that's a really good way to go about it if you don't know anybody if you're you know (laughs) i think my take on this as an experiencer who has been disempowered in the past disempowered by aliens disempowered by the media disempowered in in being marginalized in society is that i always just keep going with bringing the message out and to flick all with what anybody else is going to do. I don't, I don't care what they do. It's not my business to judge them as long as I am not swimming in my disempowerment and making somebody else responsible for a message that, that is very important to me. So, but if you're out, you know, if you're out there and you're not in a position or you you know you're too busy doing other things or you happen to be in the closet this year or this decade or these last two decades you do have to use your own discernment for for basic resonance but you also have to look at your own prejudices right and and what other people are telling you to be prejudiced against and there are very good people everywhere in every corner of society who are willing to go out on a limb to bring this message forward. Um, you, you want to not necessarily listen to hearsay about whether they're good, whether they're bad, but listen to what those people have to say on their own and look at the work that they have done. You know, give them a Google. See everything they've published. See everything they've written and see if it jives with you. There are things that, you know, the disclosures guy, Stephen Greer, there are things that he puts out that totally do not jive with what I, I've been through and what right. I know. Um, but there are other things that do. 
so this gets very complicated when right. somebody it, you're right on track with them and then you're not. Joe, and, what is, Joe, what is your opinion on it? Well, I mean, like I said before, I'm not uh, an experiencer, so I know when I speak of things like proof and half truths. I upset some people. I rouse some people up a little bit. Some people that may have had experiences or people that really want to believe. Prejudice goes on both sides of the coin, you know, uh, as far as believers and non-believers. But uh, I have to look at everything with my gut and internal discernment and not just take the story at face value, like really look into it. You shedding light on the Bigelow thing, or I don't know if it was you, but you were the first person I heard about it really really showed me a few things about what's going on here so mm -hmm. to me a half truth is just as dangerous as uh you know just having it out there just because we finally need to get it out there all right let's get to the next comment becky says yes for the most part i am happy but in my opinion it has to be done slowly because the non-believers would lose their minds if it were to be sprung on them all at once joe what's your opinion uh, that depends. Oh, yeah. The non-believers, the people that, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's right. The people that don't want to believe no matter what. Yeah. They wouldn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. The skeptics, I think would accept it for the most part. If you're a real skeptic and you're not a biased skeptic, just to be a skeptic, you know, mm -hmm. Liz. Well, Liz yeah. You know, if you're, I think somebody in the chat room had written, this is all a plot to make, it, make us atheist. And I'm like, I, I didn't know what the, it meant, except people who have a strong <laughs> faith in God might be afraid that this is a plot to make us atheist. And I can tell you that you pray more when you get abducted by aliens versus less. So that, that really doesn't jive. <laughs> You're going to rely on your faith more. <laughs> Most of us do rely on our faith more when this happens, when this becomes a reality mm -hmm. versus less. Um, so, but there, you know, if there's, there's a fear and, and what this is about is I liked what our last caller said about, this is about ascension. And, and in a sense, we're deciding whether or not we live in fear, fear of aliens, fear of each other, fear of our government, fear of conspiracies, or whether or not we ascend into love, whether or not we ascend past fear and move into an ascended state where we are universal citizens it doesn't mean universal pawns universal slaves universal disempowered little peoples it means citizens right and this is complicated the process is complicated scott says no i don't believe in this because it does not tell the truth and they are dragging their feet with the proceeding I think they can only get the certain information out that is released by the government. And I think before they get any information, this is going to go probably through, you know, one little piece of video, one piece of equipment or material or whatever it is, is going to go through so many hands in government to get permission on this that, of course, these things are going to take time. So... I do believe that there is more coming. However, I don't agree that they are on purpose dragging their feet. That's my opinion on that. Let's get to Michelle's comment. She goes, I'm a survivor of a psychic abduction. No, I will not be happy until full disclosure happens. I know that this will be a long time coming due to all the chaos that will occur with John Q. Public, and that saddens me. So again, we have someone like Michelle stating that there, there is an issue here. There is a trust factor with many experiencers out there who don't believe that the true story is going to come out. Now, Joe is someone who hasn't had an experience but is in this field and knows people who have. Do you see this as John Q. Public is not going to react when really the second stage of all this comes out, which is there is alien life on Earth. Well, I, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't understand the question. What, what are you asking me? In regards to John Q. Public, you're part of that John Q. Public who has never had yeah, an experience. Yeah, I get that part. Okay, right? the the majority of the public, you know 
it is said, and I tend to believe this, that the majority of the public does is not ready for any type of disclosure. UFOs are easy. UFOs are easy to disclose. Alien contact, though, that's a whole different ball game, my friend. No, they're not ready, because deep down they're subconsciously afraid of it. I mean, we're, I mean that's just a psychological truth. As much change that happens to all of us in our lives, we're all afraid of it. And I believe even some of the believers that, that, that say they want to believe are mm-hmm. are even afraid of it too. Mm-hmm. Liz, your opinion? Yeah, it's really hard. It's really hard to to bring the message forward as an abductee because people are afraid and they fight and they and they fight dirty and they fight mean and and even there are even experiencers who don't want to remember who will fight i mean my dad went through a five-hour interview process and he was so afraid of the stuff that he was talking about he got home and he threw all the sunday dishes against the wall you know, just broke dishes because he was so angry and so afraid. Um, it is hard to get over fear, and people don't want to be encouraged to get over fear, and they don't want to be faced with something that is fearsome. So absolutely, this is not going to be an easy ride. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get to one more comment here, and this one comes from Brandy, because that's all we really have time for. She says, I was nine years old in 1984. I was 11. She goes, I was looking out my back window in Keene, New Hampshire, and a 75-foot wide disc with three lights, red, green, red, hovered over my backyard for about 15 seconds. I yelled to my mom. It pulled back away in the yard, then surfed in the air, closed, and I closed my window. That night, several people in town had... UFO abduction experiences. It's kind of weird when everything kind of ties together after a, sight, a sighting. I'm going to get to, let's see, we got a couple minutes here. So I'm going to get to a couple here as well. Michael says, I'm not happy about the so-called disclosure. There needs to be much more of it. People have a right to know what is going on. The U.S. government is keeping a lid on free energy devices Example, UFOs. Kevin, or Kevin's beard, we're not sure which one, says, I'm not happy at all. It's all propaganda. Push their narrative and fill their wallet. You want disclosure? Listen to shows like SOR. Real people, real stories. Thank you, Kevin, for that. Or your beard, whichever one made that up. Or Andrew, all the way from Australia, says, I don't think anyone is happy. But it is better than before, which was nothing. Hopefully, we can push this more into mainstream as a community. We all know when they disclose, it will be half-truths at best. And I think that sums it up very, very nicely, Andrew. Very nicely. Eloquently said. Eloquently. There's a word we don't use enough on this show with, Liz, is eloquently. Yes, I agree. I agree. Way to go. All right. I got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal fired up with Little Brother is watching. Liz, Joe, you guys hold on. But I want to say thank you for for coming on in, joining us here in hour number three tonight. Tomorrow night on the program, our Keith Andrews is back. Keith is going to be talking about the ET connection. He comes in the first Friday of every month to talk about aliens, alien experiences, abductions, and so much more. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spaceoutradio.com. We also want to say a hearty thank you to Stephen Bassett from the Paradigm Research Group who came in the first two hours to discuss disclosure. What a week it's been. Grant Cameron two nights ago, Stephen Bassett tonight. Two very different opinions about absolutely the same topic. I love when that happens. That's why we do this. That's why we are going. Stephen Bassett will also be joining me, Grant, and many others 
at the UFO Con 2018 in San Francisco, California, March 23rd to 25th. I hope you all can attend because I would absolutely love to meet as many of you down there. Don't forget you can watch us live on Periscope TV every single episode, Monday through Friday, on Spaced Out Radio. It is fantastic that we're here. Fantastic that we are doing the show live via some sort of television. And I don't look half bad. I'm weirded out by that. Also want to say we have our GoFundMe account, GoFundMe.com forward slash We Own the Night. If you want to help us build a brand new studio here. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening at home, listening in their cars, at work. Everybody on Twitter, at Space Out Radio on Periscope TV watching us tonight in the Spreaker chat room and the veterans of the SOR Space Travelers Club on Facebook. Thank you for making this just a wonderful show. Thanks for your participation. Always a lot of fun when we get together like this because together, my friends, we own the night. I will talk to you in 21 hours from now. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a good one, everyone. We're out. Good night.